Go ahead one more time. All right, perfect. All right, let's do it. Right. What's up, you guys? I got a real uh, special guest for you guys today. My man Antonio from Leader of the Pack. How's it going, brother? Good, brother. How are you? Good, man. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, I'm very glad to have you on. It's an honor. Thank you. I've been paying attention to your page for a long time. Appreciate that. Uh, so go ahead and tell everybody just a little bit about yourself, what you do, and what makes you qualified yeah. to talk about dog training today. Yeah. Well, my name is Antonio Diaz. I'm the owner of Leader of the Pack here in Las Vegas. And uh, essentially, man, I, I help people uh, train their dogs. I break down some of the most complex behaviors and issues that people deal with, and I help them understand what's going on and give them a game plan to get their problems in order and to have a really good relationship, a balanced relationship with their dogs. So I take dog behavior very seriously. I have a lot of uh, outside of, or uh, continued education outside of my schooling. So I graduated at the top of my class. And, and, and what is that specific schooling for dog training? Yeah, so there's dog training schools out there. Some of them are oh. online. I went to one that's in person. Uh, stayed there for three months, graduated, got all the certificate and all that. And uh, and then from there, just continued to expand my education through reading and then also working with rescues very closely in the beginning of my career to really get my hands on all these dogs with behavior issues so mm -hmm. that I could really understand what's going on in, with them in their mind and in certain situations. Because it's one thing to work with a dog in a shelter and mm -hmm. go there. It's a whole another ball game bringing the dog into the house and then like, you know, having them in the house. I got Dealing three with other all dogs, the my wife. Yeah, people coming over, mm -hmm. daily routines and things like that. So you really get to know dogs on a personal level and start to understand that they literally are in in, in terms of people. They're like people in the sense of like having their own personalities, mm -hmm. their own little quirks, quirks and likes and dislikes and things like that. So it's very interesting. How long or what age did you start really so getting I, into the to the dog? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, in the in reality, because I know I was you said like, schooling yeah. and all that, but what does that age look like when you start really say like I want to work with animals? I feel like gotcha. you know what I mean. Um, so I would say that was I went to school when I was thirty three. I'm thirty nine, so six years ago, uh, I got my shepherd ten years ago, and okay. that was kind of the catalyst that started to make me realize that I had um, that I was pretty skilled at working with dogs and I was pretty good at like training dogs mm -hmm. and then but even going further back when I was a kid when I was like three years old I was obsessed with dogs and begged my parents for a dog but uh ended up not getting one until I was about eight but trained her you did yourself like, as yeah, an eight-year-old yeah Ooh, trying to do cool. yeah doing all types of tricks taught her to like hold a bone on her nose speak crawl lay down roll over paw you know typical dog yeah, trick dog stuff. stuff but yeah trained her all that stuff on my own and it wasn't until later on in my life where I kind of looked back and said, damn, maybe that meant something. You yeah, know? yeah. Like, I really loved dogs as a kid, and I was apparently pretty good at training them back then. So when I got my shepherd, after I had a, a bad motorcycle accident, got her, and then took training. I was, like, obsessed with training. And so then I really was just like, man, I think I can do this. And it so then I was I like, you know, yeah. It. Because the thing is, you know, I've had a lot of, I think that anything that, and I, and I think this about anybody, like if you really put your mind to something, you can do well at it. And But there were a couple other areas in my own life where I felt like I was pretty good at it. Like, for example, uh, I lost a lot of weight, got in really good shape, so I would consider how, maybe How much being, is a lot? Just out of curiosity. I'm sorry. Uh, no, nah, it's cool, like 60 pounds. 60. And then I thought, well, I, you know, I could be a, a personal trainer. This is back in my early 20s that I lost the weight. Um, got into a motorcycle accident, my first one, and then ended up like fixing my bike um, by myself and just and was like, all right, well, maybe I could be like a motorcycle mechanic, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so, like, I had all these things, and I'm sure people can relate to that. And that is you know, very like, relatable. you could be just jump good at, like... yeah, or just have like an idea of like, man, that could really, I could do well with that. Yeah. So, but yeah, the dog training thing, man, was just something that uh, I think is like, not to sound cliche, but it's like my, it's my purpose. You That's know? your thing. I love yeah. that. So. so then tell me, because leader of the pack, yeah. by the way, that is what attracted me to your brand in the first place. Cheers, Cheer, by the way, yeah. brother. Yes, Cheers, sir. man. Oh, man. Um, leader of the pack. As you know, my podcast, my brand, Taper Viking, Prepare, Lead, Protect. Yep. So as soon as I saw leader of the pack, I really wanted to pick your brain on that. Where did you come up with that idea? Where did you come up with leader of the pack? I mean... To be honest, uh, it, it came well. It came to me when I was in school. I was kind of going through all these different names that I want for my business, and one of the things that stuck out in my mind when I was kind of examining myself, um, a manager back at a job I had pulled me to the side one day, and he was just like, "Listen, 
I need you to be a little bit more aware of the influence that you have on other people that work here. Mm, and I'm okay. like, what, what are you talking about? Yeah, you know what I mean? He's just like, listen, you have a presence about you. Like, people follow you. You know, he's like, they follow your lead. And whether you know it or not, whether you accept that responsibility or not, like they're watching you. So when you come in here and you're, you know, doing this or you're late or you're acting this way, he's like, you set a trend. You set an example for yeah. people to see. And yeah. at the time, I was just kind of like, what are you talking about? You know, mm -hmm. I'm oblivious. I'm just doing my own thing. But uh, and then when I was really thinking about a name for my business, being a leader is something that I think is very important, and I think that that is very much directed in what I want to do and help people become for their dogs, you know? And so mm -hmm. dogs, a group of dogs is considered a pack, so leader of the pack. I find that interesting that you, that you came up with that idea before even dogs in general, that leadership mindset yeah. before the dogs in general. You came up with that during work. Yeah. I find that pretty cool. Well, yeah, I mean, it was interesting to be called that at that time in my yeah. life because I'm, you know, I mean, I was in my mid 20s and I'm, you know, in Vegas probably like four, four years, five years at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of like, what, like, whatever, man. I just want to work, make money, go out, hang out with friends. Yeah, and, for sure. It's Vegas. Told, yeah, and I'm getting told, like, people are following you. You're a leader. And I was just like, you know, and then looking back, I'm just like, damn, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then you so, were able to translate that over. Yeah. Very cool. And how does yeah. how does some of those those people skills translate into the dog world? Like, how does that leadership skills kind of? Oh uh, man. So, so another thing for me, I think again, this is why I feel like it's all purpose because everything in my life kind of led me to like where I am now. Mm. One of the, a couple of jobs I had back in my late teens, um, I worked for a subcontracting company where I would deliver and install appliances. Okay. I was always the door guy. Because I was okay. like, you know, ice personable. Yeah, you could use your communication skills are on yeah. point. Your Instagram, the way you talk. Yeah, I point. appreciate that. So, so there's that, right? And I didn't even I, the communication. I wouldn't wasn't even there. It was more like there was just something I was thrown into. I was the guy who went to the door, and I was used to being in people's houses, right? So then, fast forward, I work in the service industry. I was bartending and serving. Where are we all yeah. here? I did that too for a so, while. So, but amazing experience, and I feel like it really helps create good character for people. If you've been in that industry. And you've had to deal with people. You're talking about hungry people, irritated people, tired people. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? You can either become an asshole or you can become, like, more understanding, compassionate, and, like, develop good communication skills. And so that's where I feel like I really honed in on that. <coughs> I remember specific nights at work where people ask me the same questions. And I remember sometimes getting so annoyed. And then one day I had to ask myself, like, why am I coming into work getting annoyed? Because they're asking me the same questions about a, bi a building that they've never been in before, mm. first time in Vegas, and they're like, hey, what's that up there? And what is, wow, what is that up there? And, and I felt myself getting frustrated, and I really had to reflect on myself and go, why are you mad? Yeah, I'm These like, people for what are on vacation, yeah, 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 yeah. you know? Or like having to repeat myself uh, for like an, or specials or something like that, or I remember times where I would proactively approach tables and go, hey guys, just so you know, we're running a little bit behind schedule. So, you know, is there anything I can get you right now? Because I know you're probably hungry. If I can get you some more bread, a little salad on the side on us, let us let me know. Yeah. And people always appreciated that. And that just flows so beautifully into what I do now because I'm dealing with people who are at their wits end, frustrated, I'm their last resort. You know, maybe they work with a couple other trainers. Luckily, I'm in a position now where people are on a wait list. That's what, because so, I was trying to yeah. get, I'm trying to get a hold of this guy for like a month, and I'm all, I have to hit the wait list, and have to get the email, I have to get the assistant, and have to, but good for you. That's yeah, a great problem you. to have. So it means you're doing your job well. Yeah. So, but you know, I, I have these, these people, and when I come into their house, I don't, I want to make sure that I communicate with them well. You know, help them with their issues, and also I'm aware of how in this in my industry, in a way, people trainers can be very condescending. They can be assholes. They come in here, and it's easy to just say, "Hey, you did everything wrong. Your your dog's taking over. You're ruining your dog, or whatever." And I hear stories like that all the time. But I have a completely different approach. Like I genuinely want to help people, mm -hmm. and it's just you know finding the balance between okay, you need to do this, and you need to stop doing this, and you need to be pay more attention to whatever so, so you, it sounds like you're saying you, you I, it sounds like you're saying you're training the people more than you're training the dog yeah the dog part is easy i say that all the time and not in a boastful cocky way yeah, but it's yeah. just it's easy when you understand 
them and you can put the goals ahead of the emotions. And what I mean by that is like so many times when I say to someone like, look, you need to ignore your dog a little bit more. You need, kind of need to give him the cold shoulder, not because you're punishing yeah, and what's them. The, yeah, what's the you know? angle on that? But like, well, some people give their dogs way too much attention and mm -hmm. their dog is too pushy. So we have to kind of create a little space and we can do that, I would say energetically by not giving them attention. So, you know, when your dog comes, so when you come home, your dog's all excited. You're not mad at them, but you just kind of like can't, can't acknowledge. So you right don't now. like, oh, man. yeah, just kind of taper it down. And there's lots of reasons why that's important to apply. But as an example, just discussing that with people, um, helping them understand the value in that and, and knowing and it helping them see the goals and working them through their own emotions. Like, I get it. I know you're going to be, I know it's hard for you. Yeah, because I you want to see that. your dog. I'm empathetic. Yeah. I get it. Of course, when I right, well, look at your dog, your dog cute as shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. of course you want to say hi, but trust me, it's going to be such a better relationship for you if you don't. Just wait a little bit. Give yourself that. Like, I know you can do it. And so being able to be that for people is just like, this is my favorite part. I love know? that. Yeah. What do you see most? Like, what, like, what are people calling you? What behavioral issues? Is it even behavioral issues? Or like, what are people yeah. calling you for most specifically? I would say nowadays, after COVID and everything, it's definitely uh, reactivity. Explain that, please. So, what yeah. Get into detail. What is it? I mean, in well, because everyone got a dog around COVID, right? Because, you know, what yeah, else are you going to do? Everyone was sitting at home, bored yeah. hell. And so, and also because of COVID, not a lot of people brought their dogs out. In addition to that, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation spread by veterinarians. And this isn't, a sh this isn't shots fired at vets, but ask any dog trainer, whether you're force-free, purely positive, or compulsion, like, you know, nothing but e-collars, regardless, but you, you can ask any trainer and they'll agree with this, that um, the vet's recommendation to keep your dog in the house and basically quarantined until they're 16 weeks and they get all they their shots. They were telling people to... Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 okay. This is apart from COVID. Yes, okay, you mean yeah. just puppy. Yeah, so don't bring your dog outside until yes. they got all their yes. shots at 16 That's weeks. That's very and common. Then, I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's okay. COVID. Okay, But like, But COVID... I think the the additional scare of COVID kept people in the house even longer. One hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? So one hundred percent. Because of that, you bring now you bring this dog outside, and they're eight months old, six months old, or whatever, or they barely got out, and and you know once or twice here and there. Now they're outside, and they're like, "What the hell is? What is that? That's a car. That's a motorcycle. That's a bike. That's a yeah. skateboard. That's a kid." That's this, and they're panicking, they're barking, they're going crazy. So you're saying reactivity, you're reacting to these things. Yeah, uh -huh. barking, lunging. Yeah. And so the thing is, is behaviorally, there's a lot, there's lots of different reasons why dogs do this. And it looks aggressive in a lot of cases because people don't understand what they're looking at and like what's going on with the dog. The communication that they're trying to yeah, put around. Yeah, a lot of time, and there can also be frustration. So on the other end of that, people bring their dogs to dog parks and create what I call see a dog, smell a dog syndrome. Now, this isn't like an actual, I made this up. This is kind of my way of describing it. But basically, it's like you have a dog who goes into a dog park and they can run up to any dog that they want and say hi. So every time a new dog comes into the dog park, they get to run up to them and get that fix. See a dog, smell a dog, right? Gotcha. Now they're on a walk. They see a dog across the street or approaching and they try to go, but they can't. Why? Because they're attached to a leash. So what, in, so what happens is basically they throw a tantrum, much like a child, mm -hmm. barking, lunging, pulling, pulling yeah. yeah, kind of freaking out. And what people would look at and say, my dog, my dog freaked out and they got all aggressive. They were barking. They started biting at the leash. And it's like, well, that's not really. Where's old. that? How, do, how does one know the difference? Like, I know you're saying to us, it, yeah. it's to, to the untrained eye, it looks like aggression. But you're saying that's. Just yeah. an annoyance almost. Or well, I think putting the pieces. The so by asking questions, like finding out that, okay, you know, I ask people, okay, so your dog, your dog seems aggressive when you're walking them. Have you ever taken them to a dog park? Oh, yeah, they go all the time. Okay. So that's, I would say that's a, a red flag. Right. In terms of like the, to, to the vote against aggression. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. So your dog goes to the dog park all the time. OK. Are they ever aggressive towards dogs in the park? Oh, no, no, no. They love dogs. They play with dogs all the time. Okay. So it's really getting into yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. Has your dog ever been into a dog fight? No. Okay. Has a dog ever been maybe a little aggressive with your dog at the dog park? Yeah, there's a couple. And how does your dog react? Oh, they don't, they're fine. They just kind of like duck in their head and move away. Okay. So that tells me that the chances of their dog being aggressive on a walk are extremely low. Because you just really went in there. Yeah. So I they're around other dogs, they're fine. It's just the fact that now the context has changed. They're on a leash. 
and they're not used to that because their, their time around other dogs is mostly spent running free, off leash. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like bringing a kid to a, a, a candy store and always giving them candy, and then you bring them there and tell them they can't have any candy. You know that's, what I'm saying? Or now you're walking never by, plays out right. Yeah, or now you're walking by like a mobile candy shop, and you're like, no, you can't have it. You know what I mean? So yeah. the context has changed, but the kid doesn't understand that they can't have it because of that context. So, you know, it's uh, it's very interesting, you know what I mean, to like be able to break things down like that. And, and get and into the intricate de yeah. details. Yeah, and, like, and have those little aha moments for people. Yeah. Where like, I'm like, tell me this, tell me that, tell me that, and I like bring it all together for them, and I'm like... There, there you go, all right? Yeah. This is what we're dealing with. And yeah. I'm like, man, that makes so much sense. So that's my favorite part about what I do. It's like Dude. being able to break it down for people like that. Before I go further, I want to go back on one thing. I think we I, I kind of we kind of brushed past it, but I do want to go back. You said that vets yeah. give the misinformation yeah. about getting your Thank dog you for yeah, yeah, getting your dog vaccinated. Yeah. So to be more specific. Um, forget about like vaccination. You want to get your dog vaccinated, get him vaccinated. I don't care about that. What I, my, I'm, well, I won't discuss that, but it's more about vets telling people not to allow their dogs anywhere outside the house, basically, until their entire vaccine schedule has been completed. The problem with that is that from a behavioral perspective, the most important time for a dog to, in their development to become familiarized with the environment and things in the environment is that time frame. So eight weeks is, the, is a healthy age for a person to get a puppy. Eight right? weeks, okay. And seven, the earliest. Anything younger than that, you run the risk of the dog not developing good dog-to-dog -dog skills because they learn that with their litter mates. So oh, eight weeks is good a good point. age. Normally, I would say, from a healthy perspective, no younger than eight weeks. But that time is critical. They're, they're, um, it's called imprinting. So anything that happens to that puppy in that time frame or doesn't happen to them is very important. So exposure is extremely important. So mm -hmm. I tell people, like here in Vegas, we've got like Bass Pro. Bring them to Bass Pro. Bring them to downtown Summerlin. Home and, Depot. And this is at any age after Between, December after you get to eight, eight weeks. Eight weeks. From eight weeks. And honestly, the socialization period goes, in my opinion, all the way up until two years old. Mm -hmm. But the most critical time is between eight and 16 weeks. Are they, what's, uh, remind me, because I know the vaccination thing is very common. They mm -hmm. say keep your dog in. Yeah. At what uh, age are they fully vaccinated? S 16, I believe they have their full parvo. And that's so what they're the vets saying. Are. There's a 10 week gap where you should be. Yeah. Wow. Well, like not bringing your dog. Anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And so but the, the way that most vets describe it, and I've heard this from many, many of my clients when I asked them, I'm like, did they they were like really pushing for it? And they're like, yeah, we're terrified. I'm like, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not as bad. Well, fortunately, it's not as bad as they describe it. Um, Unfortunately, these vets are just really convincing people not to bring their dogs anywhere. So, you know, and I've said this before, I've done puppy classes where, you know, I have a group of people with their puppies. We're outside in different locations. Um, and I've never had anyone call me and say that their puppy got sick. Thank God. Mm -hmm. um, but the chances of getting... Well, you've probably had a lot of calls of people saying my dog attacked this yeah. or attacked this or, person. Or just or have or behavioral issues. My dog yeah, is So the likelihood of them of this, catching of something is a lot less than the likelihood of them getting yeah. something doing something a bad due to person, like yeah. yeah behavior due to like lack of socialization yeah and to be clear to anyone listening you know i would recommend staying away from dog parks 100 percent of the time I love that. whether your dog is a puppy or an adult you should be their their best friend and their main attraction yeah because that seems like and no offense but that seems like the because i had dogs that seemed but that was like my lazy lazy route to yeah. tire them out and, instead you know, of like doing the work I and hear working you. them myself so yeah. i'm just gonna take them there sit on my phone while they let just, them run around yeah, but yeah. they build so much bad behaviors. They do, and they, the dogs are, they have um, the ability to mimic. It's called a lemomimetic behavior in, in like the animal world. And basically what that means is they can mimic not only themselves, but other species, and including us. But more importantly, at the dog park, they can certainly mimic each other. So you can bring your dog there for three months, and three months they start developing a bad behavior of like, you know, biting at another dog because they've been seeing that and experiencing that from other dogs at the Nipping dog park. At yeah, yeah, or whatever yeah. the case is, or humping, or uh, resource guarding with toys. So mm -hmm. there's lots of reasons that I would say don't bring your dog there. But dog parks and pet stores are the two main places I would recommend staying away pet from. Pet stores, no either. When you have a puppy. Got you. For sure. Dog parks, as an adult, I'm, again, never really a good reason, in my opinion, unless the dog park is empty. And you're doing there for some training and, you know, for like some running, space. Closing. Them out. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, generally, though, I say bring your dog to a park, bring get him a, a, addicted to a toy, 
something, you know, in a healthy way. Um, you know, but get them what obsessed is, well, with the what toy. Do what does that mean? What's an unhealthy way? Uh, well, like, I oh, say, like I, well, and... I say, yeah, and I, I use the term addicted, so maybe that was a little uh, extra, but, oh, okay. you know, like to get them to really build the drive with a particular toy. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Like uh, my, my shepherd loves a Frisbee, a ball, um, and a tug toy. So when she was a puppy, I trained her and to to want these items mm -hmm. because I would play with her with them for short, fun periods of time and then put the toy away. So and she's driven on out. that toy. Yeah, so next time I bring it out, and I, I usually come, I put, I make it a comparison like this. I say, imagine you got like a 13-year-old kid and he loves to play video games. You buy him the newest game. You give it to him. You let him play it all day, every day. How valuable is that game going to be in like two months? He's going to be months, over it. He's over it. Yeah. But if you give him that game, you're like, you can only play with this for like 30 minutes, and then I got to take it back. And you stick with that. Every time you give him that game, he's going to be super excited to play that game all over again. Because he's going to find that, that yeah, value. Yeah, it's like, here it is, you yeah. know? Same difference if we have, you know, think about food at a buffet. Like, ah, it's no big deal. If you have that, if you if you have constant access to something, it's not that valuable. It's just plain and simple. Mm, you know that's what I very mean? true. And if you have limited access to something, it becomes, it becomes more valuable. Yeah, right. And that's the same thing with a dog and their toys. So when you engage with them in a way where it's intentional, mm -hmm. like here's your toy, we're going to have fun. You get the dog to love biting on a, 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 a I'll give you an example. I got this tug toy here. This is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Two-handle tug. It's made out of French linen. This is really great too oh, for like early stages of bite work. Very Imagine a dog grabbing on that, like yeah. they got a nice grip. Much better than like a rope toy or some plush squeaky toy. The dog can really bite down on that and grab it. And this is like super entry level for and you're saying, bite but this work. Is, oh, I was going to say good for bite yeah, work? Yeah, for bite work. So Great, because that's going to be, we're going to be, that's, yeah. I want to get into that topic for sure. But Go even ahead. just like a regular <clears throat> dog, it doesn't have to be a dog. When I say regular, I mean like a pet, you know, not a dog that you're going to train for protection or any type of sport work, but just a great toy where they can enjoy it. So, you know, getting a, a good grip on both these handles playing tug, you know, wrestling around with the dog, teaching them a good out so they let it go, tease them with it, make them grab it, play with it again. Just in fine engagement in the toy. Yeah. So, you know, I have a little system when I play with dogs. I call it tease, 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 reward. Okay. So I hold it out. They go for it. I move it. I almost grabbed it. it. Damn, I that worked it, for me. Right? Too. right? And, and so I, like this. I tease them a couple of times, and I build a little bit of frustration, and then, boom, I let them grab it. And now they really, you know, get into it. If you it. link that that grab to a command is that how you train bite yeah oh mm -hmm. so like don't do this at home yeah interestingly though like i was just saying that's when just, you, just clicked in my head that yeah sense. um like in um schutzen um fas i believe is the word for like i want to say attack don't quote me on that though i haven't done i haven't spoken like german in a long time um but basically yeah you can certainly attach a word to the action of like going in and biting something mm. whatever word you want you can and call then it. that's where the that's where the bite work comes in. Well, you know, the bite work actually comes from the teaching the dog. So there's different components to it, like teaching a dog to actually bite something and mm -hmm. then teaching them to hold on to it. Because some dogs, so there's a thing with dog, that dogs do, with is it's, it's a possession thing. So like when they have it and they have it in their mouth, if you ever watch like professionally trained dogs um, in sport work, when they go retrieve an item, they bring it right back to their owner and they just like hold it there versus like admittedly my shepherd i did i never went like full force with her shut sun training um which is sport work but mm -hmm. um i I, t I, end, I ended up getting more into the pet training um like just in general yeah. yeah yeah um and so i didn't really have time to dive as much as i wanted to in the shut sun but anyway like if she grabs something most of the time when she comes back she'll be kind of like doing this with mm -hmm. it just kind of chewing on it mm -hmm. she doesn't chew it but what i'm saying is like as she's coming back she might be doing this and Messing this with is a more of like a possessive trait right not in a bad way but it's just the dog's way of saying like hey this is mine mm. versus you don't want a dog to do that when you're doing bite work like you, you don't want, want them to, to you want them to bite and, and not let go let, yeah. at all and so there's a way that you train them to do that by acting like you're going to take it from them so they grab they onto it and they hold onto it. it nice and tight so Interesting. yeah but so let me ask you this so i've i have some buddies and me and my buddies, we get into these kind of conversations. Sometimes even at the barber shop, we get into the kind of conversations. Where, and I'm, I'm very curious from a professional perspective. Do you recommend with a family, children, you know, imagine the nuclear family. You mm -hmm. got a wife, you got two kids, boy, girl. Yeah. Do you recommend a dog that's bite trained? Like protection work. Prote yeah, okay. Now, yeah, I don't want to yeah. say bite trained. That's yeah, too yeah, specific. Yeah, yeah. 
protection, sorry, a protection dog. A protection dog. We're not saying a dog that snuggles with you and watches Moana mm-hmm. with the kids. We're talking a prote- that dog is for that purpose. It is a working dog. It is a protection dog. It is in your home amongst your children, your wife, yep. yourself, maybe other, da- other animals. What's a professional perspective on that? Do I recommend that is what you're asking? Essentially. I would say that really depends. I would say if someone is going to be dedicated to that dog and like serious about what it takes to have a dog like that, then absolutely. Can can we talk about what it takes to have a dog like that? Yeah. From the owner perspective. Yeah. If I want to have a dog like that, what does my day look like? What is like a day in the life of a dog, who, of an of a owner who owns a protection trained dog? I would say <clears throat> practicing obedience mm-hmm. um, or just at least implementing it daily in your, in your life. But is that like 20 minutes a day or is that like what is a day in the life of an owner look yeah. like? So I would say, again, practicing it and whether it's 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there, I don't think it's important to focus on like time frames, mm-hmm. but just implying or excuse me, implementing some form of obedience. Like every time I let the dog out to go to the bathroom, they sit and they wait. If they're going to come out of their kennel, they sit and they wait. If I'm going to feed them, they sit and they wait. Um, if they're, I wouldn't allow a dog like that on furniture, personally, um, or I wouldn't recommend it. And the thing is, is though, you have to understand when it comes to like with dogs, every dog, has, again, has a different personality. And there might be a household that has a dog that sh- that is watching this and they're like, well, my dog's a protection dog and they're on the couch and, and they're fine. And I would say, yeah, I so it could be specific. Yeah, yeah. But I think as, a, as a, if we're going to just put some general rules out there, I would say that one thing that's really important to understand, and I don't think a lot of people under like get this is that when it comes to having a protection dog, number one, you have to make sure that the person that you've hired to teach your dog protection and teach you protection with your dog, it has to be really good at what they do. Yeah. Number two, the dog has to have like the most solid obedience. So obedience first. Yeah, hundred percent. Because well, here's the thing: you don't even start protection work with a dog until they're about two years old. So you have to bite have work is different. Dog, yeah. You can start bite work as a puppy, and that's just teaching the dog to bite things. But as they mature, you start to teach the dog to what to look for in a person, certain cues, and you have to train them through that. So mm. there's so it's now it's know, now it's like you taught them to bite, but now it's how do you who do you bite? Yeah, who do you bite? Yeah, exactly. When do you and bite? you're not trying to just raise a trigger happy dog because that's a liability. So people think that oh, I'm gonna train my dog to be protective, but they don't ever teach the dog an, a, a, like a, an off switch. So you tell them, yeah, get him, get him. And then your dog is getting them, but like, oh shit, that's my cousin. Like, yeah. no, stop getting them. Yeah, and your dog's like, well, no we, don't, we never practice, stop. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, there's that. And that's not the dog's fault. Exactly. Yeah. And there's also, you know, if you have a friend or maybe a guy you haven't seen in a couple years and you're with your dog, and I come up to you, let's say I haven't seen you in five years, 10 years. I don't know, you had that dog for two years now, mm-hmm. your protection dog. And I come up to you and I'm just like, yo, Tommy. And I come and I shake your hand and I hug you. Does your dog know that I'm friendly or is he going to start biting the but shit out of me? Let me counter that a little bit. If a dog is protection trained, would he not wait for a command? Because I feel like. Some dogs are I feel like a dog. I feel like, let's just say a dog whose intrinsic mindset is to bite and protect, but they haven't been trained on how to use that weapon properly, right? They haven't honed it in. Now, same scenario. You come up to me, my boy. I'm like, Antonio, what up? You give me a hug. Now, the dog who isn't trained, it seems, I'm not a professional, but you are, but it seems like the dog who isn't trained might be more likely to attack because it's not certain, right? Yeah. But when it's been trained, it's almost like a dude who carries a gun. A guy who carries a gun based off fear and never trains it might pull the trigger Absolutely. way quicker than the guy who's been trained on how to carry a gun and yeah. a lot less fear-based. Exactly. I mean, I would totally agree with that analogy. I and mean, that's yeah. the point, though. So, like, taking a dog, you have to understand that if you're going to get a protection dog, that you want to be able to dedicate the time and the resources, money, to getting a good trainer. And then on top of that, continuing that training throughout the dog's life. Because those are behavior trait. You're, you know, and the thing is, is that it's not necessarily aggression that we're training in a dog it's we're training them like if you ever look at a dog like a police dog for example Mm -hmm. that dog is like extremely driven and it's fun for them like they're like give me that arm i want that arm they're not worried about the person they're worried about the arm 
Do you know what I'm saying? There's yeah, no yeah. vengeance from the dog. They don't it's know just, the person. They want that. that. They want the arm. That's it's, what it's they've, a game to that's them. That's what they've driven. Yeah. Off of, like and this toy. turns into the bite sleeve, turns into the bite suit, turns into mm -hmm. a leg bite or an arm bite or whatever. Because mm. the dog is trained to pinpoint certain locations on the body, the arm, the leg, the inside of the groin. Would you happen to be linked up? Because I know you said you steered away kind of from mm -hmm. the protection. You were leered into more to the pet. But do you happen yeah. to have a connection for anybody I can talk to about? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know uh, word, a word? good friend of mine knows, uh, has a good friend of his who's a trainer who does bite uh, when protection work. All right, we're going to so, yeah, yeah. link that up. Um, but, but yeah, so, you know, and just so everybody listen, no, I, I don't I don't train protection dogs. I do. I know a bit about it just because I was it was something I got into early on with my shepherd. Um, and then at the time, though, my work schedule and all that didn't work out. And then when I got into dog training, I really focused on the, the in the home pet behavior kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You know. So, OK, let's say this perfect protection dog would be obedience trained right mm -hmm. by someone like you. Or the protection trainer, if they can do it, they, you know, I'm sure they yeah, can do yeah. obedience for sure. But let's so, but let's just say that we would, let's say someone is not ready for obedience. I mean, I'm sorry. Let's say someone's not ready for protection mm -hmm. and they just want to do some obedience right now. They can do obedience up to about certain years. Then they would switch over to more protection work. And then with a, it's almost like having, now you switch your major to protection with a minor in obedience. So you're still doing the obedience. still doing obedience. You know what I mean? Like, but by that point, the owner itself can be just really forcing the obedience while the new trainer is now doing the bite work and not bite work, you know, protection. Yeah. So I would say just at practicing that obedience. Like as an Love example, it. you know, if you don't, it's the same thing like we'll say with people. If you don't use it, you lose it. You know what I mean? So if you think of anything you've done in your life that you never, maybe you dabbled in something, you thought you were interested in it, and then you're like, ah, I'm not that interested in it. Okay, so you did it for a year. In, in three years, if I ask you about that subject, how much of it are you going to be able to tell me? Mm. Probably not that much. Not much at all, yeah. But if it's something that you're really passionate about, something that you practice all the time, and I ask you about it, you'd be able to tell me a bunch of things about it. The same, history, yeah, the currency. Same yeah, thing yeah. with the dog. If I don't practice obedience with that dog, within months, Less, but in a month or two, the obedience can, um, the, the quality and level of obedience can deteriorate very quickly. Even with my own dogs, I have to do refreshers with them. Keep them going. Yeah, and keep yeah, them yeah. going. Some of the videos that I have online, you know, um, I've, I've practiced before I shot those videos. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I walk my dogs, sometimes if I'm, you know, busy, I don't always have them in a perfect heel. Like they are, I tell them free. Just let them run around. Like Dude, they I've, deserve that. You know what I mean? They're great dogs. Just so you know, I've seen some of your videos where you were riding a bike. Oh yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Don't worry. But you were riding a bike, and you said, "Does your dog know how to sit?" Yeah. But you were like, you were implying. I saw what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. That most people think their dog knows yeah. how to sit. The sit means butt on the ground until and don't move until I say free. That was ridiculous. Yeah. Again, that's gonna go on the screen. But that's just uh. uh a just a like homage to what that is that's yeah. that's very impressive so that's what i mean like that is so impressive I, thank you i appreciate that uh, Jeez. but having a dog like have you ever seen a video and i, I have where there's a, like police dogs they, they go they chase a, sub, a suspect they get them thank you the uh you know and the cops yelling at them out you know like basically let go yeah and the dog won't let go that's, that's a what problem. out means i've heard that in a yeah. bunch of police in videos. german it's aus Okay. You know, so you might but hear him say that, like or yeah, and uh, I forget what it is in French, but you know they'll speak a different language basically. Mm -hmm. um, and this way, like suspects can't potentially tell the dog what to do. Um, but and not just that, the suspects don't even know what the commands are. Yeah, you're giving them, you could be saying something exactly. Like or in kill, some cases, but they, they just might think even it's... just train the dog to respond to an e collar, so they don't have to say anything. They just press a button, and the dog knows. And but it reacts. but the point is, is like I've seen videos where the dog does not let go. Like that's mm, a I've problem. I've seen. I have seen. You know too. what I mean? And, and you're like, so, yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. And I imagine, you know, and this is what I mean when people, because I've had clients that say they want their dog to be a protection dog, and like, first of all, like, I met your dog. Your dog's not. <laughs> it's not, not. Your dog's not into that. Trust yeah. me. You know what I mean? Like, they don't have that heart. That's number one. What are what before? What are some of those traits? What is that? What does that look like? In I would dog? say a natural defensive trait. So and a how dog. How do you see that in the day to day life? By testing them, life. there's like little tests you can do by kind of like, um, as an example. Um, something you can do for, um, like I would do, is like get a stick and then just kind of smack the ground 
and mm. l- lower my head and stare directly at the dog and approach them really slowly. That seems uh, it's almost like, like uh, don't try that at yeah, home. Yeah, no, don't do thing. that. Okay. But, but like, <laughs> depending on the dog, some dogs see that, they perk up, and when they see you take a couple of steps towards them, they're like, uh, they start panicking, they look around, they're like, I'm out of here. So that's not a thing. Yeah, that well, that's not a good sign. Yeah, that's not a good sign. That's yeah. what I mean. That's what yeah. I mean. Sorry. Um, in terms of like, would a protection trainer go, hey, we can work with that. We can still probably make something happen. Maybe. I don't know. I don't do it. Yeah. You know? But um, but if you if a dog if you do that to a dog and they look at you and they're like, what's up? Yeah. They charge that's you? a good they, sign yeah, that you could be if, that, that could be that's a natural defensive drive in the dog. Do you know yeah, what I'm enough, saying? Yeah. That's like an easy way to test it. Very like uh, low level stress. We're not trying to, you know, freak the dog out. But like just kind of testing them a little bit. Like, what's up? You know, yeah, yeah. The dog's like, I want all of the smoke. <laughs> That's go. part of being yeah. leader. That's yeah. part of being an so, alpha. Yeah, but, but a lot of people don't even realize like, you know, their dog is running. When the doorbell rings, they're running and panning certain circles, barking like crazy. And they're like, oh, yeah, I want to be a protection dog. I'm like, yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you know, the same some thing when people are like, I want my dog to be a service dog. I'm like, he bit three people. I don't think your dog should be a service dog. Yeah, like, yeah. you're not going to bring them on planes. Is there, like, breeds for certain things? So, like, for example, if a dude, if a dude just wants a, a emotional support animal, is there certain breeds for that? Or uh, like no, nah. I mean, I think most dogs can be an emotional support animal or even potentially a service dog. Um, there are some breeds that are that tend to be the norm within those services, even with like detection dogs. You know, you've got labs that are really a lot. A lot of labs are in um, detection work now, like bomb yeah. sniffing, drug sniffing. Shepherds, of course, staple dogs in service work and in Any police kind of or protection. Those German shepherds, yeah, Belgian yeah. You got the Belgian Malinois. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, same. I had one. Okay. Said, you know, I had a, a buddy barn. Uh, Bar none, yeah. bar none canine. Yeah, Robbie. Robbie Taylor. Yeah, that's my boy. Yeah, he trained my puppy Jada. No way. Okay. Yeah, but I so I had a divorce. That's America's top dog champion, right that, there. I know it is. I'm gonna be getting my boy on too. Mm. Um, Bill, um, yeah, have him on and then have us back on together. I love Robbie. Bet. Oh yeah, hell yeah, Robbie. I'm gonna have him on. I'm yeah, actually Robbie and I went to the same school. Really? Yeah. Dude, he's. He he's an amazing great. trainer. He's yeah. an amazing trainer, yeah. an amazing person. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's a very good guy. I, I haven't talked to him in a minute. Like I said, I got a divorce, and the the pup got the repercussions. There's a picture right there. Him and my oh, puppy, yeah. that's Jada. Let me see that real quick. Yeah, please. This is my, you can see, see, yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, he did wonders with Jada. I spent so much time with that dog. I spent, I'm that's getting so all emotional. I spent so much time with that yeah. dog. That Jada was my, literally my, my road dog. She was trained. This yeah. this puppy was trained. Look at look how beautiful she was. I know she was. I know he did a good job. Yeah, she and she did. She was, and like you were saying earlier, he was training me how to train her. That's good. Which was it was just amazing, thing. especially because I know Robbie does boarding trains. Yeah, I don't. Did. Yeah, I didn't do that. Yeah, he because I because like. Oh, is he doing private sessions with you? With me, I don't oh, know okay. what he does now. Yeah, it's been now a while. he's more more board and training. Okay, yeah, it's yeah. been a while. But I know he still makes a point to like work with his clients, which yeah, a lot of trainers come to don't. Me. He came to my house. Okay, we used to go to the park together. My dog had an issue with um, with uh, reactivity. Yeah, she would like react anytime she saw a dog, bro. He got it to where anytime. So pre Robbie, right? I'm walking to the pup Jada. She'd be pulling, and then like she'd see a pup immediately. She's charging, never vicious, yeah, yeah. very sweet pup. But still, after Robbie, a couple of sessions with Robbie, bro, he's walking. The pup's walking right next to me, healing. And then if there's an, if there's any kind of thing, it looks at me before it does anything. Like it wants it wants a command. Yeah. It doesn't act. She'd never acted without something. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Crazy. Mind blowing. I haven't talked, and it's funny because I haven't talked to him in a while, but but that's cool. Okay, yeah. cool. So I'm going to tag him in this too. We'll yeah, you should. This. Okay. So, anyway, let's get back to it. Um, let's say, I'm just probably going to have to be a two parter, but okay. let's say that uh, someone, it's any goal, is you're a dude, you want to purchase a pup, and you want to get the pup trained. Eventually, the end goal is protection work. Uh, just figure preparedness, survival, yeah. like how useful a dog could be mm-hmm. in a survival preparedness situation, For sure. how useful a dog can be in a protecting kind of situation. And uh, if a dude's like long, you know, at work all day, he wants a, something to protect the house while he's gone. Let's go take me through that journey. Okay. Right. How do, how does a family know they're ready for a protection dog? 
P- puppy. We're talking puppy. Follow the journey. I want to go the journey with you, okay. and then with the protection guy. So, with just so you talk, how does a family know that they're ready? Yeah, like when? Yeah, when do you know that a household is ready? Is there a sp- like? Do you need to have a house, a big yard, a small yard, or the dogs being crated anyways? Like yeah, you see I what feel, I mean? Yeah, I mean. How do you know you're ready if you don't have a lot of time? Do you have a lot yeah, of time? I would say a lot the, of kids in the house. The biggest thing will be time, and then okay. the management of children. Because a lot of people have this issue where they're like, oh, well, you know, I can't, you know, if I tell them, like, hey, your dog and your children need to be supervised at all times together because kids are kids and dogs are dogs and you're putting them together and there's yeah. going to be issues. So, and I'll say, how people say me, say to me, uh, well, you know, that's not really realistic. And I'm like, well, it has to be realistic. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> that's you know so, I mean? yeah. Like, you have a Belgian Malinois and you have a two year old. So, like you make that decision whatever you do is on you you know what i mean because that you sleep at night not me but like yeah you have to so timing and then good management so if you got kids understanding that you're going to have to take the lead on training that dog an example real quick when i got my shepherd when i went out with my wife when my shepherd was a puppy i brought her everywhere so much so that my wife would say to me babe, can you please leave Brooklyn at home? And I would look at her and go, why? And, you were like, nope. and she was like, well, because I want to spend some time with you. And it's like, you're always focused on Brooklyn. And I was like, I know that, but I have to be because I need her to be a well-trained dog wherever we go. And in order for her to be a well-trained dog wherever we go, she has to come with me wherever we yeah, go. Yeah, wherever you go. So I could train her to That's be a well-trained re- dog. Wherever you go. Be wherever we go. That's the reality. It's a circle. That's just, yeah, that, do you need so, some more, by the way, brother? It mm. looks it looks a little watery. Mm. I'm okay. All right, bro. Thank you. I appreciate it. I also it. got beer if you're... No, I'm good. If you're thinking, all right, cool. Um, but, yeah, so I would say number one time, and then the second thing would be management, good management. Perfect. You, you get know. the time, you get the management. You got that, and you're telling me you're dedicated and you're ready to do that? Okay, what kind let's of pup go. are we looking for? I what kind say, of dog? I would say, Protection, I mean, I, I'm a little kids. biased. I would say uh, definitely a German Shepherd or a Belgian Malinois. I love Shepherds. But, okay, now so I've noticed... I would you, say you could also do, like, Cane Corso... Those are really great dogs. Do um, any of these dogs show up on the list of dangerous around kids? Because um, like I'm just, because like I'm thinking of it from a perspective of someone who just goes and like okay you know what I'm working all day I'm gonna get a pup I'm gonna just Google ta- you know dogs not to have around kids yeah. will Belgian Malinois pop up? Uh, maybe. So I'm not sure. Okay. But I would say this though. I don't care what. Because I don't dog, believe statistics. I don't, I don't I'm care. asking you. Yeah, I don't, that's the thing. I'm though. telling them care. not I, to I'm, believe I'm statistics. I'm with you because I have a client that reached out to me that they have a golden retriever that bit the husband and now just bit the wife. So and golden put, retriever. Golden retriever. And here's that's a fun, the full house dog. Here, yeah, and tell and explain oh, this to me. Golden retrievers are some of the most. How do I say this? Golden retrievers can be some of the most mouthy, bitey dogs because of by trait, they're very mouthy because they're bred to retrieve things. But also they they actually bite quite a few of people, quite a few people Mm. um, in the house. And it's usually children or like elderly people. But the, the reason why those bites aren't known is because people don't report them. Why? Because they're usually in Not the household of yeah that and they're they're golden retrievers in in the in the households that they're in, you know what I mean? Yeah, like we nobody, don't want to. No, yeah, nobody I know. wants to you know go tell on little Toby the golden retriever yeah. that he just bit little Timmy the kid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but you get Diesel the yeah, pig, yeah, <laughs> or just, Roddy or something yeah, like that. and they're gonna go call the cops and you know you're gonna put your dog down. Good point. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean honestly, golden retrievers bite a lot of people, but wow. people don't realize that. And I've heard golden doodles. I posted a video. Sorry to interrupt you. I no, posted please, a video on my Instagram where this golden retriever is at the end of a flexi lead. I think being held by a kid. So it's this this lady. I'm thinking. I want to say this lady and what seemed like her mom walk in their little dog and then this woman and her son like probably like a nine-year-old kid walk in their golden retriever the golden retriever like gets his head real low his tail's wagging mm. goes up to this dog just snatches him up and starts shaking him like a rag doll the lady freaking jumps on him and like in my video then it cuts to me just explaining Explain like what it is. golden retrievers bite too if your dog has teeth they can bite and so when you ask me a question like you know, what dog would I not want to get if I have kids? I mean, if that's the case, I would say don't get any dog, mm. you know? Okay. Like, like that. there's always yeah, a possibility yeah. of them inviting somebody. And just so you know, I'm playing the devil's advocate. I hear I you, I had yeah. a German Shepherd and a Belgian Malinois, 
amongst my two babies, and I trusted them fully. They were yeah. trained, and I did, like you said, I monitored and everything. So I'm just playing the devil's advocate here because I know some people are worried about breeds, so I For just sure. want to really pick, pick at that. Yeah, I mean, any dog has the capacity to bite. If they got teeth, they can bite. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. But some dogs, I think, genetically do are, are more driven, mm. you know. But, again, nothing in dog – that's the same thing as, like, people. And I say this all the time. It's like saying, that, you know, all Asian people are good at math. Well, <laughs> I mean, no. But it's no, like, no, well, I know, but yeah, a lot of them, it's a statistic. Yeah, but that's not necessarily true <laughs> yeah, across the board, Yeah, that's not all the time Exactly. Yeah, so, it's not that exactly. much. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, any Asian person you know or friend, you're just like, hey, help me with my math homework. They're going to look at you like, bro, I don't know. I'm failing it, too. What do you want yeah. from me? Yeah. But same thing with dogs. Like, yes, there are some tendencies, but it doesn't. it's not a guarantee that yeah, you're going to yeah. get a particular type of dog and they're going to be a certain way. Personality, I think, is the more, is the more de definitive trait. Can I ask you this? Now, okay, we're going on the searching journey. We picked a Belgian. Is there a way to tell these traits before you pick the puppy? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I see the mom now, I see the dad, both Belgians. Does it matter if they're papered? In this world, I mean, that we're talking about in this scenario, you, in some people, I would say yes. For me, it, it does not. I've seen paper dogs that are trash. But we're talking about training. What can papers tell me about training? About a dog's temperament? I is would that, say is that, well, how here's that the works? thing, though. It's not no, um, no. You want to go again it, because it's personality. And here, here's another interesting insight into like personality. You have brothers and sisters. I do. I have okay. one brother. Same. I have I have a few sisters. So we're very different. <laughs> My we're similar, the opposite. yeah, yeah but opposite. we're different. But you came from the same mother and father, right? Same mother and father. All right, so why are you so different? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So same thing with dogs. Well, yeah, here are the parents. Okay, great. Let Show me the litter. Show me the grandparents. Do we have the grandparents? Do we know what other litters look like? This will give me some ideas Do about papers some tendencies. Tell that? No, it just gives it gives me the the. It's basically like a license. It's saying or a certification. It says this is qualified according to these standards with looks and potentially temperament. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But like for the most part, it's about looks and traits and features of a dog rather than temperament. Dogs aren't necessarily bred for temperament. And the, if you find a breeder that's breeding for temperament, I would say that's good because- That's a thing, they can do that? Well, yeah, because you breed dogs that are a certain way. Like if you're gonna breed police dogs, you want dogs that are freaking like really driven. And wired, and so, wired, you, so you like get those and you breed them together. I see. Yeah. So that is all but traits that are genetic. they can have a litter that has a dog that's just like, mm, I don't yeah, really chill. care. Yeah, I don't want Got that you. ball. You know what I mean? So that's okay, so now we, we're ready to get the dog. We, we decided on a Belgian Malinois. We go, we see the litter. What am I looking for now to tell me I'm getting ready for a protection dog that's going to be ready for all the things that we're about to put it through? You'd want to look for the dog that when they put the food down is like pushing his way through the rest of them to get that food. You're so the one that's dog. most... Yeah, you can, call like, it, you can call it dominant, but I would say, I would say a dog that's very outgoing. Mm -hmm. A dog that seems like they could care less. You know, if you drop a bar or a toy or something of interest to the puppies and that dog is trying to be the first one there, that's a good sign. That's you a want a dog sign. that... The thing what is, if is there's like, three or four like that? Then pick one, the one say, that you yeah, look yeah, the nicest Yeah, then I would say you that? can look for other qualities. Second? Yeah, what's yeah. a secondary? I would say a dog that... Well, I would... You know, you don't want to take tip too far over and a dog that's going to be like too much to handle. Mm -hmm. So if I see those same puppies and three of them are rushing to the food, but one of them is already biting the crap out of the other two, I would say, okay, I don't want that one because that yeah. dog literally already has resource guarding issues. So I'd rather have the other one of the other two who were, their drive was there, but they weren't just trying to fight everything around them. You know what I mean? I see what that you might mean. be a little bit too much for most people to handle. A dog that's willing to take it that to that point that early on in their life, like they haven't even reached adolescence yet. You know what I'm saying? I see what so, you mean. Yeah. Um, that would be important. And I think too, a dog, um, I would say a, a puppy that, for me anyway, well, let me rephrase that. For somebody who's looking for a protection dog, um, I would say a dog that's confident. So if you put like little. What obstacles. does that look like? I know confidence in a in a male or in a female, but what does confidence in a pup look like? Uh, I would say a puppy that's willing to, let's say, face something that's uncomfortable. So as an example, let's just say you have like a little seesaw mm -hmm. thing, right? And really, really small, but it's it's like mm -hmm. this: the puppy walks up it, and as it starts to 
you know, flop down to the other side, they just walk across it like nothing, or they run across it, or they jump across it. That's a confident puppy. I see. Another puppy walks up on it, and as soon as that thing starts to move, the puppy backs away, and they're like, hell no, I'm not doing that. Granted, you can build confidence in puppies, and I do that stuff all the time, but, excuse me, and something that you want to look for early on, minimal work, was a dog that's already confident. Perfect. So a dog that's already, again, kind of like taking the lead, sees something they want, goes for it, um, and a dog that's interested in moving objects. So some dogs can be confident. Some dogs might rush to the food, but if you roll a ball across the floor, they could care less. So some so, dogs are like food driven, toy yeah. driven. Things so if like I that. roll a ball across the floor and I see a dog running for that ball and super interested and intrigued in that ball, that's a good sign. So would means, you rather a pup be? I'm sorry. No, would sure. you rather a pup be food driven or toy driven? Mm. What's the preferred? I, I mean, think, if, is there a preferred? Yeah, I think for protection work, we would say toy driven. Toy, because it's yeah. not more to bite onto and latch yeah, onto. Exactly. Like so that. toy, we can we can compare toy drive to prey drive. So mm. basically, something that moves, the dog locks onto it and won't won't unlock from it and wants it and will you know continue to pursue it. Yeah. And that's a really good trait to have because it's exactly what you want in protection work, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, or especially like in, in police work, really. Um, I mean, protection work is just tra training them to, depending on the level of it and what you want from the dog, but most of it would just be like protection, so de a defensive mechanism, you can consider that. Not a dog that would actually like chase somebody down. Yeah. You know, although you might want that if they're on your property. That's... But once they're off your property, then it's a liability. So you want to but you, you have, have I mean, a recall. What you have, that's what I was going to say, a you recall. You have like, ah, yeah. come back. You know okay. what I mean? Like, <laughs> Not gonna, right, we're, <laughs> we're not gonna keep going. We're in lawsuit territory, too. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of people don't recognize the importance of obedience. I tell people all the time, if you want to get your dog to be protection trained, go for it. But you better make sure that before you even start right. that, that every time you say sit down, come here, stay, place, crate, whatever that is, that they're doing that shit like like, like it's, right like away. No, yeah. That's, yeah. That makes sense. So. Okay, so we get the pup now. Belgian Malinois, we pick the right one, we take it home. Are we creating it right away? Or are we letting it roam free around the no, house? No or are we free. giving it a room in the Well, the, the first house? thing I'm doing with a puppy when I bring them to the house is taking them outside to the bathroom. Outside to the <laughs> That's bathroom. That's the first thing I'm doing. Perfect. I'm bring them outside. Let's go potty. Good boy. You're going to reward that potty. Then uh, when they come reward in. Reward with toy or with food depending on their drive depending or what? Depending on their drive. If I'm doing a protection work, I would immediately start toy training. And playing with toys. Toys right yeah, away. Right away. Love Easiest it. way to do it, in my opinion, is you can get like a, uh, especially for a young puppy. I got mm -hmm. a slip leash here. You can use a slip leash. You can use, so this, th the slip leash is intended, this part goes around the dog's head and neck. And then this piece right here locks it in place. So if this is the dog's head, this is their neck, this actually this little slide here secures it so that it doesn't open. But, oh, but does that, like, does that like pinch them? Or like? No, it doesn't. It doesn't so pinch humane them. So humane and all that's cool. Well, yeah, I mean, when you apply pressure, it tightens up. So it could be very much inhumane to use it in a way if you're trying to choke People them out. People could, yeah. yeah. I mean, but you can what use What is anything. this called again? A slip leash. slip leash. What's a Martin Gale? Martin Gale? Gale, it's sorry. It's similar. It's almost like a, it's a cinching collar. So basically, um, if you can imagine this, I don't, I don't have one on me, but... Um, are we getting a collar right away, right now in this situation where the dog is? Yeah, and the stuff I would get him acclimated. I would get him acclimated to wearing a leash and collar. What kind of collar? Sure. This one. I like slip leashes because this can grow with the dog. Okay, and explain the martingale, and then we'll continue on. Yeah, martingale is just a collar that has. Think of a flat collar like your typical nylon collar. Yeah. Right, and then on um, halfway through, it's got two rings and then a chain that connects those two, and that chain has a little ring that when you pull. It the chain, the, the bottom half of the collar cinches. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, how, how do you feel about those? I'm fine with them. And then yeah. prongs. Same what about thing. the ones with I'm the prong. hooks? Yeah, I'm cool with prong collars. I use prong collars in training. Now, do I need to put a prong collar on a puppy that young? No, because I'm going to be... Not, in, in my opinion, at that age, you know, there's an old school method of training where they say you had to wait six months before you train a dog in obedience. Mm. And I firmly believe that one of the reasons for that was because at six months old, the dog is, is a little bit more... Um, capable of withstanding some of the harsher methods of training that were applied. Mm -hmm. If you do, if you apply those like same shock methods, collar or whatever? now well, just like heavy handedness, you know, it's okay. more like punishment based. It's, it's, um, it wasn't so much focused on what they wanted the dog to do. Like for if they wanted a dog to like. 
grab a hold of something, they mm -hmm. would pinch the dog's ear until the dog opened their mouth and then put the item in their mouth. And that's how they would teach oh, it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So like, uh, just as an example. Mm -hmm. But like, the point is, is that back in the day, they used to say six months was the age to start obedience training for a dog. And now you, you, that's not true at all. You can start training a dog as soon as you get them home, mm. because no, we're talking seven, eight weeks, like we said. Yeah, okay. because you're got you have you're using nothing but positive reinforcement. That doesn't mean that you can't apply any correction to a dog. I've met plenty of young puppies, where I'm like, that dog's a psychopath, and he needs to be a, he needs to have a correction, especially Fair for enough. like biting and things like that. And what does that look like? For well, what depends. does a correction look like? Uh, for a young puppy, we've uh, all been at biting. our friends' houses where. Yeah. Their correction is a newspaper to the forehead or yeah, to the no nose. Yeah, then it creates like a dog that flinches. I've seen water bottles and shit. Not a fan of those. So either. what's a correction? Uh, I'm very physical, so you know I don't mind putting my hands on a dog in a healthy way. So I'll give you guys an example of what I mean by that. So uh, number one is we'll talk about biting, right? Because mm -hmm. biting is a common issue, and that's usually a common issue with my clients with for, with their puppies. Where I'd say here are the options. If none of those work, here's how you can apply a correction. So the first thing to understand about biting is that it's a natural behavior that dogs do. Mm. It's like having a baby, and you're like, well, they keep putting things in their mouth. And it's like, well, no shit. It's a baby. That's what they do. That's, they their, shit. Mouth, That's right? their thing, yeah. Same thing with a dog. They're going to walk around. They're going to bite things. Most people, when their dog bites them, they you know, will point at the dog and say, no biting. And if the dog's biting at their hand, now you just created a moving target. So don't do that. Mm. If you're walking uh, across the carpet and the dog latches on to your shoelaces or your pants and you start shaking your legs... Don't do that because now you've created another moving object. That's the same thing as me taking this toy and going like that to the puppy. What do you think mm. he's going to do? He's going to bite it. Yeah, it's so more like, that's oh, number shit. One. Yeah, yeah. Don't do those things. What you should be doing is getting things like this, or as I was going to say before, even like a dish towel at home or a dish rag, you basically um, tie a knot in one end and then attach the, a slip leash, something like this. Or if you, if you have a regular leash with a snap on it that attaches to a collar, you basically would do this. So ba to, to a degree, I'm looking to have something like this, right? And so mm. now I have, I call this a back saver because now I can toss this on the ground, move it around and create prey drive with my dog. So I want my dog to bite things. So you're gonna be like, oh yeah. I just don't yeah, want them biting me, right? I so I proactively give my dog these things the to right bite thing on. The right thing to bite. Yeah. So you're not saying don't bite, you're saying bite this. don't bite me, now, bite this. So, so it's important that we understand this in its entirety because there's what you should be doing, which is giving your dog the right things to bite. Mm. Giving them chew items like bully sticks, yak sticks, marrow bones, rib bones. If you're a raw feeder like me, then all these raw meaty bones, A-OK. -okay. Give them these things so that they can chew on and fulfill that desire as well. So there's chewing and then there's like biting different, mm. right? So giving them the right things that they can put their mouth on. Now, when my dog tries to bite my hands, the first thing I'm going to do is take my hands away, mm -hmm. right? So these are these are non. Are you doing? I know it sounds very silly, but are you doing like fast motions, uh, or are you just like yes. kind of like ah, get away? Mm. Pretty fast. It depends on the dog. Because my, I know it sounds like a silly question, but no, uh, my all. my thought is if I'm whipping it away quick, that's like you more. with this toy, yeah, 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 whipping it away. You're right, and so this is why I say it depends because sometimes people, I'll tell them to do that, and then they do that, and I see how it almost like creates a little bit more intensity from the dog. Like, mm. okay, now I want it more. I want it, I want it, I want it. Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, okay, let's slow it down. So I think it really depends. But those are options. <clears throat> At the end of the day, we'll keep it simple and say, remove your hands from the dog. Just remove it, right? okay. If I'm going to pet my dog and my dog is constantly trying to nip at my hands, I'm going to say, okay, well, you know what? I'm not going to pet you right now then. I'm going to wait till you're a little bit more tired. I'm going to intentionally get you more tired so that I can pet you without you trying to bite me. Because if you're petting your dog and then they try to bite your hand and then you punish them for that, let's just say your method is like smacking them or mm -hmm. whatever, then it, couldn't it be potentially miscued by your dog or misunderstood that now when you reach for them, they should be defensive? Yeah. Because yeah, you're being you, playful yeah, and you're smacking and then them, you're right? smacking them. So then there's the other suggestion that most trainers give, which is if your dog comes up to you and bites you, redirect them and give them a toy. And we're, talk we're not talking bite attack. Yeah, we're, we're talking, talking about like nibble, biting. play, yeah. bite. Okay. And so I think that that is good advice in the short term, but absolutely terrible advice for the long term. And what I mean by that is very simple. 
if the only thing you so if you're not if you're not engaging with your puppy and proactively getting them to bite the right things mm. right and giving them and saying hey bite on this and then your puppies constantly come up to you because they want to play and they're not being fulfilled by you and they're coming up to you saying hey i want to play and they bite your hand and you go oh the trainer told me to get them a toy all we're teaching our dogs is to come and bite us to make us go get their to toy. To go get the toy. So there has to, again, so like putting all balance. this together, yeah. you need to be proactive. Now, with all of that said, if at the end of the day I have a puppy that is a little shit and he keeps biting me, and even though I've given him exercise and play with him and given him all these things, my preferred method of dealing with that in terms of a correction is very simple. On the back of the dog's neck, just like on us, if we, if we had somebody squeeze the back of our the neck skin. right there, not the skin, the muscle, oh, like okay. a little pinch. Oh yeah, right, yeah. right, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it's not comfortable. Not at all. So th that's exactly what I'm going to do to a puppy. If they start biting on my leg or my hand, he's biting on my hand. Very calmly, I'm just going to gently. I say gently because I'm not going to start off by squeezing the crap out of him. It's not retaliation. It's more of like, a, hey, this is what happens when you bite me. I'm not mad at you, but I'm just trying to let you know. Leading. Yeah. Is that leadership yeah, role? Like, that, don't do yeah. that. So I just, I start gently and I increase that pinch until the dog is like, get the hell off me. And then I just take my hand away. And if the dog tries to jump back at me, like, hey, what the hell? I completely ignore that. I'm not mad at you. We're not going to, I'm not going to engage with that. Engage, with you. You're going to ignore them. It's just like, yeah, whatever. That's what happens though. Now, I, so that I see the dog snap at me because he's got a little attitude. I don't say a word. I don't acknowledge that. I put my hands back down. The dog comes back over, tries to bite my hand again. Pinch. Sage down again a little you bit. Do it again. I'm just showing the dog, like, look, if you bite me, that's what happens. There's an uncomfortable response. You may not like that, and I get that. <clears throat> you're not supposed to, right? Yeah. But I'm not going to acknowledge your attempt to retaliate because you're a puppy, and I'm, I'm a grown man. So I'm not mad at you for that. When they start getting a little older, the corrections, I'm sure, get a little bit more. Well, no, if you're is that neck them, thing still work. Oh, well, you wouldn't need to do it if you're doing it correctly and you're doing it on time. Because you have a command. Well, no, a behavior like that wouldn't even be done anymore. Oh, uh, because so you've not, already nipped it in the butt. Yeah, the only command in regards to biting would be out or drop it. To just let go. To let go, to and that would be up. that. And I teach drop it through play, and that's how drop it should be taught is through play. In other words, you don't want to teach your dog drop it every time they grab your slipper or every time they grab a piece of paper towel or napkin that fell on the floor. Why? Because they're never going to get that back. They're not supposed to have that. But when I teach a dog drop it with their toy, drop it, they let it go. Boom, I give it right back to them. So then what do play, you, play, play, so play. what command do you give if you don't want them to get it back? Like leave it's that shit alone. Just drop it. Same one. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, thought you so, said you, I, thought, I thought I heard you say you can't. No, no, no. I'm saying that the best way to teach a dog drop it is through play with an item that they Got can't it. have. Just to the teaching part, but yeah. not the usage of it. Correct. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so if a dog has something they shouldn't have, you can still apply drop it because they understand what that means. But you don't want to teach it from the perspective of they're not supposed to have it and I need them to know drop it. And you want them to teach it in the perspective of drop it, you'll get it yeah. back. Just drop it right now. Because now Real we're quick. talking about allowing a puppy to roam around the house freely, which you shouldn't do. Now they're grabbing your slippers, a sock, underwear, this and that. And you're constantly like, drop it. And the dog doesn't know what that means. It's so just like, drop, pick up, drop, bop, so, bop, bop. Well, just drop it, and then you got to come over and take it out of his mouth. So yeah. if you have a strong-minded dog that you picked out from the litter that's confident, that ran over to that bowl... What do you think is going to start happening after you do that a couple of times? That dog's going to start growling at yeah, you. Yeah, it's going to start and being a little a more aggressive. And it's like most, you know, people are going to look at that and be like, oh, you need to shut that down. It's like, ah, I can understand that perspective. But what about from the dog's perspective? He's a fucking puppy. He's running around biting on things. I'll take a little bit. He's running around putting his mouth on things that he shouldn't. That's the equivalent of having a two-year-old kid run around putting uh, um, forks and knives in outlets. Yeah, it is, you would can't you yell at him for more. having a fork, or would you look at yourself in the mirror and go, maybe I should do a better job of keeping forks out of my kids' hands, and keeping enough. them away from the outlet? He's a kid, so there, we have to understand it's a puppy. So again, giving him the right things to bite on, right, and then teaching. I, lo him to I love. I just want to say play. that I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, I just I love how you. I want to make that distinction that you're saying don't teach them to stop biting, but teach to just redirect their bite. That's a that yeah, is, bite I think on is, this. yeah that's a very big distinction that I've noticed a lot of people don't I'm very glad you you brushed up on that yeah thank you that's that's very good let me ask you this now we're back onto the journey okay 
we get the pup home, we decide that we're not going to let the pup roam. Are we crating the pup? Yes, absolutely. Oh, like what's the crate schedule look like of a pup that's so growing, me, that's of a baby pup, eight to yeah. seven to eight weeks of a baby pup, what's the crate schedule looking like? So that would depend on your, that depends on your schedule, but it would look something like this. In the morning, so the dog's crated at night. All night. Yeah, unless they have to go to the bathroom at that age, they probably might need to go twice throughout the Like a the puppy. Night. Yeah. I mean, like a baby. You're yeah. going to wake up and take your baby out. You're going to wake up and take your puppy right out. right back in the crate. Right outside to where you want mm -hmm. them to go. Go potty, right back in the crate. Perfect. First thing in the morning, I wake up, I take the dog out of the kennel, and I bring them right outside to go to the bathroom. As soon as they go to the bathroom, I'll start playing or and or training them. Do you? So you're saying you take them outside, do you wait for them to use the bathroom before you do anything? Yes. You don't play with them right Nothing. away. You just sit there and wait. Yeah, like in it. terms of potty training. Yeah, I that's refer, what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I refer to it as um, uh, throwing a potty party. So <laughs> okay. I named it that because it's corny in it, but it's easy to remember, right? Yeah. So throw potty a potty party. party. What does that mean? It means this. Most it's so self-explanatory. I love that you made that up, yeah. but go ahead. So uh, this is what most people do. They bring their dog outside. Their dog is off leash, free to roam, sniff around, exploring, being a puppy. They go to the bathroom, and immediately they bring the dog inside. And from the dog's perspective... They could be that could be very disappointing. I already see because now the the, the dog's like, well, I was just having a good time, and now I peed, and now and I gotta I go back inside. in. And so what they'll do is they'll start to procrastinate on peeing because they understand that the sooner they pee, the sooner they go inside, and the party ends. You're saying just switch approach, that perspective, switch it up, have them on a leash. Gee, yeah, this, we're now we're in Boringville. Go potty, stand there, nothing. As soon as the dog goes potty, that's a good boy. Potty party. That's a good boy. Let's go. Right. And they start playing. Now, I teach the dog, the sooner you pee, the, the sooner faster we're going to get to play. play. And we'll get right to it. And how so now, simple, yeah. but how effective. Yeah, very effective. So Beautiful. Then, not only that, but right thing, the, the right, first thing in the morning, what I want to get to is like getting some energy out of my dog. He's a puppy. So the, the amazing thing about puppies are a lot of people don't know is that they sleep about 18 hours a day. So they're, they're up. Yeah, for I six can see hours. that. Like babies. Yeah, six hours. So if you can you can expedite that process of them going back to sleep by working them mentally and physically. So physical and mental stimulation are extremely important. Physical and mental stimulation can be applied through obviously exercise, physical stimulation, but training, mental stimulation. Now if we combine playing and training, now we're working both at the same like time. Task stacking. Yeah. So I love for that. example, if I teach my dog how to play with the tug and I teach them sit and down, I can put them in a sit and a down and work on stay. So now I have their favorite tug, I drop it on the floor, and they get up, ah, ah, down, let's try again. I drop the tug, they stay in a down, okay, free. They go get the tug, I have them bring it back to me, we start playing tug, we're playing tug, right? I tell, I take it back, I tell my dog sit, I tell my dog heel, I tell my dog, you know, walk with me, down, front, sit, free, boom, we start playing again. So I now I'm making it. them work for this. You're we're playing, <laughs> but when they're stacking, stacking behaviors, yeah, so yeah. I'm making the dog think. I'm making the dog focus. You got to listen to me because I'm going to bring you through some sequences, right? You, is this something you can do right after they pee? I know it sounds silly, but yeah. now you go pop. Yeah, you assuming know. like now we're talking like from your, from your storyline, you know, I just got the puppy. So technically this is like the first morning I'm with the dog. So he wouldn't know it's all these things. Fair, yeah, yeah. Right, but, but I would still play with him. I would just be playing. We were just playing tug with like no strings attached. But once I start teaching the dog a couple of behaviors that I can apply in play, um, then I start to do what's called play training. Now we're playing and training. So the reward is the toy. And the other thing about rewarding dogs, whether you're using food or a toy or petting them, is that it should be viewed as an event and not just a particular object. So, for example, I tell my clients, when you're going to feed your dog food, don't just feed them food like a Pez dispenser, like, yeah, here's some food, or like a robot, but you want to get excited with them. If do you, do you recommend, I've heard some trainers say, make them earn everything. I mean. Like everything almost. I like would sit, say, I've seen some trainers say, you got to make your dog sit before it even goes through a door. I agree <laughs> with that. But let me just, let me give you my insight on that. So I think it depends on the dog. I work with plenty of dogs where I didn't have to apply it to that intensity. And I work with other dogs where like, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That dog got nothing for free because he couldn't. He had behavioral issues. The dog just, you know, wasn't, it, it was appropriate for me to be that strict with the, with specific dogs. 
Um, but I would say more importantly, it's not just making them earn everything, but teaching the dog. I like to say it like this. I create the habit of having the dog listen to me. So the more that I ask the dog to sit and wait to be let out and sit to be let out of their crate and sit before their dinner and sit before we get into the truck and sit before I throw their ball. Mm -hmm. The more I make them do that, the more of a habit it becomes for that dog to listen to me whenever I ask for it. So you're just kind of doing it I'm just doing to just build to a habit. It. Yeah. It's Love like if that. you're raising your son to be whatever, mm -hmm. you want to kind of like apply mm -hmm. that. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're going to, let's just say you're going to raise your son to be a boxer. You're like, you're a boxer. You like to, you know, whatever. And are you just going to practice boxing with your son, like, during the practice times? Or is that is boxing going to be a part of his life? It's going to be like every it's gonna, day. It's like every day. Yeah. Like, you're just going to be at the grocery store. And you're going to say to your son, one, two. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're going to throw up your hands, right? Yeah. And you're going to, like, that's what you would do because you're trying to keep it fresh in his mind. Like, keep boom, it going. boom, 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 right? Same so that these are muscle memory plus. responses and not, and he doesn't have to think about them. Um, and so I would apply the same methodology to training a dog. I'm going to apply these things all the time, mm -hmm. wherever we go, because I want you to listen to me wherever we go. And I want you to know that when I say sit, it's that, not it's mm -hmm. not just at dinner time. And that's the thing. A lot of people are like, oh, my dog will sit when I feed them dinner. It's like, yes, but because that that's how they know that they won't get that food until, until they, sit. they sit. But they don't connect they, sit to with everything sit. else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they and just so, connect sit with food. Exactly. With, with dinner time. Yeah. And so, or maybe it's sit with, you know, going out of the back door, but that's not applied anywhere else. Mm. And so this is why I tell people you have to practice it. And it's not about, you know, control or dominating dogs. It's about a relationship. It's about like, it's like having a kid and you just want them to listen to you. It's that simple. If I ask you to go clean your room, I don't want to have to tell you 50 times. Yeah, you want to say it and get it I done. I want to be able to say and it. And you want them to do it because they vow, like because they respect you. Yes. Not because they like fear you. or be, exactly. You just want them to do it because it's so much easier yeah. that way. I love exactly. that. Exactly. When you garner that respect. Yeah, and, and in my opinion, the way that I've used this, I've said this example with people when it comes to dogs, comparing them to children. If you have a kid and you're giving them an allowance to clean their room and do chores, that's great. That's the positive reinforcement. We're saying, yeah, if you do this, I'll reward you with this. But there might be a time in your life where you're like, you know what, we're going to save up for a family trip or we're going to save up for a new house, a new car, whatever. So you come to your kid and you say, listen, you're doing a great job. I appreciate you, but we're not going to be able to give you an allowance for the next couple of months because we're saving up. Mm -hmm. And your kid looks at you and says, well, then I'm not doing my chores. <laughs> well, yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you are. That's going to go pretty That's going to play consequence, out Consequence, well. consequence, consequence. Yeah. And it's the same thing with a dog, except we can't tell the dog, well, if you don't do your sit and down stay like I ask you, then I'm not taking you to the park later. You can't do it that. Doesn't you, work you can't that tell way. I'm only going to give you half your food tonight if you don't do it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. they have to get a consequence in that moment. And I'm not saying that, you need, that that's where you break out the old newspaper, but I'm saying like a consequence can be as simple as making the dog do it. If I tell my dog sit and they don't sit, and I make sure they have a leash on them because I know that they need help, and I bring I grab the leash and I help put them in a sit. Mm. You know what I mean? Or put them in a down. And so at the very least, I just make sure that they they do it, just like I, I would with a kid. Like, yeah, gotta you gotta make, it. you yeah. gotta make sure that you Because if you don't do it, when I say sit or down, I'm gonna make you do it anyway. And I'm not Fair mad enough. at you, but it's happening. Fair enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I love Just that. following through, really. I love that. Being yeah. persistent, being, 100%. being consistent. I'm sorry, not persistent, consistent. And yeah, persistent. And persistent, yeah. yeah. More persistent than the dog. Yeah, I tell yeah, people yeah. that all the time. Love like, that. oh, I tried. Yeah. I'm like, you need to try a couple more times. Yeah, keep it going. Yeah. I've noticed during this little chit chat, you've been saying so many commands and words and things like that. So let me ask you this: back to the you know the journey. Mm -hmm. What are the first few commands I'm teaching the pup? Five. Let me say five. Okay. Well, is there a number? Uh, that, like, is there a first well, I would like, say a like first six or a first official three? commands? Yeah, there's like five. What's the first five say. official commands I should be teaching my pre-protection pup? Well, the first two that I would teach any dog are going to be come and I would say sit would be the first in two. that order uh, what's the yeah. first tell me the first I would say probably come and you want to make that's before sit that's before anything come yeah the reason why is because it, I feel like it could be a lifesaver for the dog love that yeah. 
they're wandering out, you running know, somebody, into traffic, whatever, yeah. you know, I want to okay. be able to say come and have that dog know to come back to me. Come. Um, okay. I just think that's very, very important in any situation. So then, and the next one I think is just, um, for me, when I teach the recall come, it's a two step process, if mm -hmm. you will, two behaviors really. So it's the act of the dog coming to me and then they sit in front of me. Or so you want them to, to sit. So the yeah. command isn't complete until they sit. In a, at a at a, in a more advanced level, at a basic level, we're still I just talking puppy right yeah, now. Yeah, I just want them, I just want them to come to me. Okay, know? I love but that. Then, but I can easily sneak in the sit at the end of it, you know, very easily. Mm -hmm. It's considered, in my opinion, a more advanced recall option to call the dog and make sure that they sit and wait for your release, um, because a lot of people have issues. What I call like a drive by or a tag and go, where they they'll call their dog. And their dog comes to about like three feet of them, and then they run off. Yep. Or they come right. And they consider that look, you came. Like, yeah, 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 I came, but I leave. Yeah, yeah. And so like I tell people, like, if you want a more advanced recall or at a basic level, when you call your dog, they should come to you and close enough so you can grab them. Mm -hmm. A little bit more advanced, they come to you and they sit and they wait for you to tell them when it's okay to get back up. So, but the first two, the first one I'm teaching is come. Mm -hmm. Then. And then, uh, I would say. Um, the next one, honestly, I would say probably be crate training. Crate. Oh. So crate would be a command. Okay. Um, and then from Is that there, like equivalent like home or like? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I would, so then between sit and down, I would say sit first, heel, and then down. Heel is next to you. Yeah, down heel is walking next to me. Down will be one of the last ones that I okay. teach. Okay. And then place, which is like to go to their bed. But I would probably Only a bed or that. is place a place where you point at? Anything I point at. But that's that's more advanced. But at a basic level, going to their bed it would be place. You can you can teach a dog like if you point at anything that has a bed defined is different boundary. than their crate. Yeah, because it's it's not enclosed. Bed. But you can use so crate is it like a cushion a, or is it like a one? Of, I've seen those little elevated, things on yeah, stands like with like bed. yeah, like okay. that, like a pet cot. Yeah, 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 yeah thank you, yeah. cot. But uh, I mean, you can use a crate too. I have people that have like you know smaller apartments and. You know, I look around, I'm like, well, there's not a lot of room for a place bed, and I don't want to, you know, crowd your space. So if you have a crate already, we can just teach the dog to go to the crate on command. But um, in terms of crate training, you asked earlier, like, what what does that look like? Yeah. Basically, I tell people, like, three to five times a day, at least three to five times a day for a puppy, have a routine where you do uh, training, play, and then play training or exercise. Mm -hmm. And so training is a little bit more focused. This is where I'll use the dog's food to feed them and teach them behaviors because it's easier. We can use a lot of Normal food frequency. like the regular food. Yeah. Okay. I'll use treats if needed, but ideally I just feed them their regular food. And then the reason for that too is because we can get so many more repetitions in in such a shorter amount of time. If I'm using a toy to teach obedience, it's possible, but there's like a, that thing. Yeah, or there's a delay. Thing. Yeah, there's a delay. So if I tell a, if I teach a dog to sit and then I reward them with the toy, there's got to be at least five to ten seconds of play, you know, for it to be worth it yeah, for that yeah. dog. Then I've got to get the toy back, take it away, make them do the behavior again, and reward them. If I'm using food, I have a whole bag of food. When the dog sits, I give him a piece of food. I tell him free. And is their I, food different than their treat than their treats? Yeah. Just want to clarify that. Yeah. So I use kibble if I can. I have beef liver treats, freeze dried beef liver that I use as well. Is there like a brand you want to name drop that um, we know of or anything like that? Well, the brand is called Stewart. I get it on Amazon. I have an Amazon uh, storefront. It's on there. And then Lucy Pet. Is there a way I can take that and put it in my description or something so people can look at your? I can send you the link to my storefront. Please yeah. do. That way, I'll, your storefront can pop yeah. up, and what you suggest, you yeah, recommend on to Amazon. be up there. Perfect. Um, I have toys and treats and stuff like that. So okay. this will be oh. on there, too. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, Lucy Pet, it's salmon, quinoa, pumpkin flavor. It's really good. A lot of dogs like it. Mm. And most of the time, I tell people this. I'm like, look, if you're going to use treats, try this instead. Now, so everyone knows, I feed my dogs a raw diet. So they eat, like, raw meat and all that fun stuff. But, That's how I deal with Jada yeah. for Robbie's recommendation. So, um, but I use kibble for training treats instead of dog treats. I try. I, I, you, and so I you use feed them raw food, but you mm -hmm. buy kibble just for treats. Uh, it's a higher quality kibble. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, do you have a brand for Lucy kibble? Lucy Pet. Oh, that's the one. Lucy for kibble. Pet. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry. 
Yeah, Lucy Pet, and then another brand um, I used to recommend, but I heard that they got bought out, so I'm not so sure. I won't even mention them. Then there's another one that's called Carna Four. Um, that's, Carna Four. Yeah, C A R N A, and then the number four. Um, super expensive, like premium kibble. But if we're talking protection pup for the family, raw. I'm talking. About, if you're talking raw. about any. If, quality food i mean i i buy my food from the grocery store and prepare it myself so i don't even go through third parties mm. they have third party raw that's ship you food not my thing i'll get it from the grocery store um but what i was saying going back to the crate i want to get off topic no oh, you're good this um, is beautiful. having a routine with the dog where you you know train play play train exercise downtime downtime is crate so I tell my clients all the time with a puppy, create your dog multiple times throughout the day. This is not punishment. This is their home. This is their home, but this is building this is building mental fortitude. This is building this is creating a dog that like a child needs to learn that there are times where they will not be attended to, that they will not have all attention. But they on have them. to deal they on have their to own. deal with being alone and even though there are people there, right? So when I say crate your dog, I always recommend if you have a two-story home, you have a crate in the bedroom where the dog sleeps with you. They're social animals. I think that's a good place for them to sleep with their people. Um, in a crate. In a crate. And then a crate in a common space like a living room or a den area, family room, where the cr dog will be in the crate periodically throughout the day when you're going to like prepare dinner, when you're going to sit and watch TV as a family and, and kind of have a crate and rotate schedule where you let the dog out of the crate for, let's say you're watching a two hour movie, 20 minutes in the crate, 20 minutes out, 20 minutes in, 20 minutes When they're out, out what are they doing? Hanging out with you. Okay, not peeing. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, on leash with mm -hmm. you. I know this sounds like a super silly but specific question, but I'm being honest mm -hmm. here. Do those crates have to look the same to make it feel like they're home or should mm -hmm. they be different so they know no. what's their sleep Location crate? will define the difference. So it doesn't matter the crate? No. Does the size matter of the crate? Yeah, it should be some crates. Um, if you're gonna get like, uh, if you have a shepherd, for example, we're still talking pup. Yeah, about but 10, if you're gonna get, they're get, probably get at the about crate, a year now. Get the crate for the size that the dog is going to be. Okay, they're I've seen some crates with separators. Enough. Exactly, and then use the separator or the divider to create a smaller space for them to be in. So the space should be big enough for them to stand up, turn around, and sit down and freely and no bigger stand up yeah spin, turn, spin turn around and sit and lay yes yeah, that's it lay down. no yeah. walking no steps no. no good to know because they're in there just to lay down good to know so the idea here is that you intentionally train your dog work them mentally physically get them tired and then they, they learn that even though they might still have a little juice in them it's time to relax now what do you say to the people and to the family members and to the people out there who say my dog is like my child. Mm -hmm. If I'm watching a movie, my dog's not going to be in a crate. What do you say to those people? I mean, it's your dog. Do your thing. But does that... We're still talking about a dog that's about to be protected and trained. Yeah. So what do you say uh, to those people? I would say... And you're their trainer. Yeah. And you come to my house, chilling one day. We're having a, some whiskey. And you see my dog, not in its crate. And you tell me, hey, bro, why, this, why is it not in its crate? And I'm like, well, you know, it's like my child. I'm not going to put it in this crate while, while we're watching this movie. So here's what I'm saying. And you're my trainer. Yeah. Hey, Tommy, I totally understand that. But let me just help you explain something. Or let me help you understand something, rather. The more that you create him now, and you have just little periods of him being in the kennel, the more acclimated he'll be. So this way in the future, when for whatever reason, you need to put him in the crate for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because you can't pay attention to him, he's not going to lose his shit when he's in there. Right now, because he whined a little bit and you felt bad and you let him out, what you just taught him is that if he throws a little bit of a tantrum, you're going to let him out. Just like a child. Yeah, huh? the next time you put him in there, he's going to whine, and that doesn't work, so now he's going to bark. He's going to keep going and, then, and going and then until let we out. let him out. And then you're just building his tolerance, and you're building that mm, intensity. Just like right? children. So, And here's the thing. like For me, anyway, as somebody who does this professionally, when I work with clients and somebody says that to me, that's exactly how I'm going to talk to you. I'm like, look, I get it, but here's what's going to happen. And if your goal is to have a solid dog mentally and emotionally, because they are emotional animals, you need to start teaching them at a young age that 
there are some things in life that kind of suck. And I'm not saying that we're intentionally putting the dog in there to like, oh, he's got to learn. It's just that there are going to be points when the dog's in there and he doesn't want to be in there. Yeah. And just because he doesn't want to be in there doesn't mean he comes out. He still it's got just to like be in a kid. There. There's plenty of things in our lives as children we didn't want to do, but we had to do them. I didn't want to rake the leaves. I didn't want to shovel the snow, but I had Take to do the trash it. Yeah. Things. I didn't yeah, want yeah. to clean up the dog poop, even though I promised my parents I would before I got the dog. <laughs> right? yeah, I didn't, didn't want to do it. I wanted to go to the party, but I couldn't go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So did my parents feel bad? I'm sure they did. I'm sure they were like, yeah, I feel bad, but you know what? We got to we got to stick to our guns and we got to we told them no, we the answer is no. Mm. And that's the same thing with the dog. And so early on at a young age, even though the dog doesn't want to be in there, at some points, we do everything we can to fulfill them outside of being in the kennel. This is why having a relationship with them is so important and like actively being a part of their raising and their training and their playing. You're the best thing in the world. Yeah, because now it's like I've given you all this and now I'm asking you to just lay in the crate and just chill so I can take mental time off. Yeah. Because if you're really raising a puppy right, then any time that puppy is out of the crate, your eyes are on them, your attention is quickly, on them, yeah. or they're attached to you literally with a leash. So Even you know where home. they are. Yeah, because the next thing you know, your puppy's over there in the corner peeing, pooping, or chewing on something. And most people are going to respond to that like, hey, no, yeah. hey. And I tell people all the time, like, do you realize what a tyrant you look like to your dog? They're just being a puppy. They're wandering around or like, oh, what's this? Is that a gallon of water over there? I'm going to start chewing on the edge of this thing. This thing is really nice. Oh, look at that. There's water leaking out of here. Lick, lick, lick. And then you come over and you scream at the dog. And the dog's like, whoa, man, you're really messing up my vibe over here. <laughs> yeah. Right? And you keep doing that. So how is your dog going to perceive you in two months after you catch him every day chewing on something that he shouldn't, yelling at him? He doesn't understand not to chew. He only understands you are the party pooper. You're the yeah. one who comes over raining on his parade every time he's getting into something. Perspective. And that's a relationship killer. Who wants to be that? Rather than being the guy who, yeah, it might seem a little rough or hard to do at first because you're restricting your dog. You got him on a leash. They're not allowed anywhere in the house without your supervision. But you're the guy who's always like, hey, buddy, look what I got. Boom, let's play. Right, and then you put this away, and then an hour later you bring it back out. Like, hey, guess what time it is? And your dog is like, man, this guy this just guy knows is, me. Yeah, he knows yeah, what yeah. I want. And he just gives it to me all the time. Yeah, once in a while he asks me to do something I don't want to do, like stay in my crate. But man, when he lets me out, we're right here. We're and in we there. do everything. That's a relationship, and that's going to be a dog that will die for you. you I know love I mean? that. They'll do whatever you yeah. whatever you request. Absolutely. Okay, so back to the. Let me ask you this. I noticed on your Instagram, and I also, from Robbie, but playing the devil's advocate, tell me the difference between shock collar, e-collar, and when do we present it? Okay, so... I yeah, know that's a very touchy subject. Yeah, some would argue that there is no difference between a shock collar and an e-collar. And I would say that there is. I think the, the difference is in the way that you use the collar. Fair. So... An e-collar is an electronic collar. If you know what a TENS unit is, it's... Say that one more time. A TENS unit, it's um, like you've ever had like... Unit or t TENS unit? T-E-N-S. TENS unit. TENS oh, okay. unit. Okay. I've never heard of that before. Okay, so I've had some issues with a shoulder back in the day, and like I had a doctor, he put on like two um, pads <coughs> on my arm, and they start turning up this machine, and you're like, let me know when you feel it. And mm. it basically sends like electrical impulses into the muscle, which will make the muscles uh, spasm contract. If you've ever seen like one of those corny commercials for like the ab belt, like you wear the ab belt and it just like works out your muscles for you. Shit. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. It's the same technology. Okay. Same stuff. Except now you're talking about that same type of uh, current going into two points. Two prongs. Yeah. That are That's very direct. The e versus like, yeah. Now, when you, I have. Do we have an you, example yeah. of that? Yeah, please. Have you please. Ever felt one? I have. I used to. I, uh, Jada was oh, on okay. one. My my Malinois, but just for the people, yeah. uh, you know, what is this here? This I mean, is, let me uh, see the box. Yeah, well, the box is not. So the, I have the, the remote for, that came in this box is at home. Okay. This is the one I use for my clients. But this is remote. not the same with the of this box. Correct. See okay. the remote here. It's oh, a different okay. Remote. So this one is what I use for my clients. Same brand. It's just that this one is for, like, professionals. It's up to four yeah. dogs. This one is up to two dogs. Two dogs on one collar? Yeah. 
I'll put it up on the screen, Brian, or everybody. But this is uh, it says mini educator. Yeah, and so you know the the so basically the difference I would say between an e collar and a shock collar is the, what it does. If you blast the dog, and they're May jumping, I? yeah, and they're you know they're jumping out of their skin, then yeah, that's a shock collar. That's not really how I like to intend, or how, that's not how I intend to use uh, a collar like this. If I'm using an e-collar on a dog, I like to um, build them up to where they, I can see that they feel it, but they're not overwhelmed by it. What does that look like? So I'll give you an example. Put this on your arm. I just hold that there. Just let me know when you feel it. Am I supposed to put some kind of pressure? No, just let me know when you feel it. There it goes. Okay, so you're level 10. It's like a little like a little pulsating kind of yeah. thing. Some people would describe it as like little pricks. Like yeah, little, like, little yeah pricks. like little pricks. Yeah. So you are able to tell me that you feel it. With a dog, they won't be able to tell me, but so I'm looking for certain cues in their body language that would tell me that they feel it. Mm -hmm. and, and what does that look like specifically? Every I've seen different. some of your videos. I'll post them yeah. up if you can send yeah. them to me. So every dog's different. Um, just let me know what, what topics you want and I'll send them to you. But um, every dog is different. But like an example of some common ones is if a dog's wearing the collar and then they, and they I'll go up just like I did with you. I just scroll up on the levels. What does a high one feel like? So this is 10. High is all relative. So, so like, like, what does that go up to? What do you want? It 10. goes up to 100. Ooh, give me uh, 40. Okay, I'll go to 40. Let me just show everybody. Let me see on this one. This is what I'm going to put up on the screen. All right, go ahead. Uh, Son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. Yeah, not at all. Let yeah. me get a little more. And so just so everybody watching and listening understands, like, you know, we're not looking. That's 55. So Whoa. you see his finger? Go ahead. Ah, ah. See how I made his. Ah, ah. <laughs> you can see it on your forearm. God too. damn. So Woo. it creates what number muscular. Is that? that was uh, 55. All right, go ahead. Just for the record, I blasted myself on 100. Like, I know what this collar feels like. So when people, you know, there's people out there that are like, you know, put it on yourself and see how it feels. Like, oh, I have. I have. I to have. Every level, I have. And, Woo, um, boy. I would, never, I would never have ever put it on a dog without feeling exactly what this feels like. You know, and the thing is, is that these collars are very powerful in both their ability to help dogs and their ability to completely ruin dogs. So I think, and I would not think, but I just want to make sure everyone listening and watching understands that this collar is not to be uh, played with. It's a what age did you introduce tool. this? In our, um, in our pup, in our pup. I, I, well, I had a puppy. I would Woo! say the earliest I've ever had it on a dog Boy. was four months. Four months. But the thing Four is, months. is that again, and it, I, I've noticed it's not. It's, and what's interesting, it's not pain. Yeah. It's like reaction. Yeah. I can't explain it, but it's not like pain. It's just something you've never felt before. I would so with with the age. Like I said, four months is the youngest I've ever put it on a dog. But understand this too: we're not talking about causing the dog pain and discomfort. There's just an awareness that he feels what's on there and that at that like a age, wake up call not even it was more i was just teaching the dog for example like through obedience how to turn it off mm. so if he got up from his sit he would feel it but it's not it was never enough for the dog to be like ouch you know what's happening i just knew that he felt it mm. and so when he feels it and i'm holding the button down and i put the dog back into a sit and i let it go i'm teaching him at a very comfortable level how to turn it off it's as simple as that. So then as he got older and we applied it more as a correction, when he felt it, he knew exactly what to do when he felt it. You got it. At a stronger correction yeah, level. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So association is everything. And if you put this on a dog, even at a low level where it doesn't hurt them and you're punishing them, yelling at them, scolding them, being an asshole, they're going to associate this with negativity. Same thing with, like, any other behavior. You know what I mean? Mm, so yeah. 
Um, but yeah, very, very powerful, great training tool, I think, but very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. You can ruin your dog. Would you recommend someone use this, like, with, I don't want to say without professional guidance, because obviously you know, but like, you know, you figure you go on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, you, you could, um, uh, people can, but the problem is, is that, the I would say the biggest problem is that people don't fully take the time to like understand how to use it and they assume that it's a quick fix like i've had a lot of clients that go well i want my dog to come back and so i put the collar on them and when they didn't come back when i called them i zapped them and i'm like well that that's not good at all because mm. did, does your dog fully understand in that context it, at the park or on the hike that they have to come to you like, do they fully, really understand that? So how does this work in with that? How would you train that in? Well, number one, I would start, even if the dog's wearing the collar, by not using it and just teaching and focusing on the telling the dog what it means to come back to me. Without even them. using Without it. Even Without even using it. Just keeping this on them. Yeah. For then the like same thing. It. The way that I use this is pretty, for the most part, pretty standard with obedience. Um, I at a low, it's called a working level. So... When you told me that you first felt it, that was level 10. Level 10 would be your working level. And that could even change. If I'm using it and I notice that maybe and you're a little so, distracted so, just by Just so it. everybody knows, when he means I felt it, it's, it's almost like, like this. Like, yeah. it wasn't like... Like you just felt it. You just feel it. Yeah. That was at level 10? Yeah. Okay. So that would be your working level. So if I taught you to come to me when I call you, and I know that you understood it, I would test that by calling you and seeing if at least four out of five times or nine out of ten times you come to me when I call you. Great. Now I know that you know what come means. Mm. So then I put, um, and now I have the collar on you, and at your working level, at level 10, I allow you to become a little bit more distracted in the environment. Now I call you back and you don't respond, and I say no, and then I press the button at level 10 and hold this, and I guide you back to me. As soon as you turn with this around. With leash on. With a leash on. And as soon as you turn around and face me, I immediately start praising you and let this go. So this doesn't equivalent no leash. Correct. Not yet. Not yet. We're still yeah, talking young Because buck. imagine that you have a dog, and you, they're out there, and you, you, know, they, you call them. They know what come means. Great. But they've never felt this before. So yeah, now you yeah. put it on them, and this is what most people do. They're like, well, this thing goes to 100. Let's start at level 20, right? Why not? Hey. It's 20. Yeah, exactly. Hey, but 10, I felt it. Yeah, but so 20 is going to be a lot, you know, for you. Yeah, yeah. If I'm just blasting you at 20, you're going to be like, what the hell? But imagine now, this is what people do. They put it on their dog, and then they call them. And the dog doesn't here, come. right? Yeah, and then they go, no, and they tag the dog. And now the dog is like, what the hell was that? And then they run in the other direction. Yeah, that's an what aggressive, do you do now? Yeah. Yeah. Do you keep, do you keep hitting them with the e-collar until they come back? No, they're going to keep, gonna keep yeah, going that way. keep running. Because right? you haven't trained them, but yeah. that means come back. So, and there's so many problems that can develop with the misuse of this, which is why it's important to, like, really know what you're doing. Yeah. And even my brief description of how I use it, but please don't take that as, like, training advice for you. No, no, please, 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 yeah. real quick. You guys, if you're going to use something like this, please get proper yeah, training. Hire somebody. Hire somebody. Uh, if you're not going to listen to that, at least the least you can do is go on this man's page. I've seen you use it. Mm. I've seen you say, oh, that's the dog's reaction right there. That's how mm. it was. At least educate yourselves a little bit. Please don't throw this on people. I mean, on people. <laughs> please don't Poor throw people. this on puppies and zap them. Yeah. And I think that would be the difference between an e-collar and a shock collar 100%. is the user. Yeah. So shock. So and it's, so here's the other thing, another way that I would word it in terms of the difference between an e-collar and a shock collar. An e-collar is a quality remote collar. And it goes from zero to like 100. Yeah. Some of the other cheap ones do. but and here's every some, number in between, right? Yes. Not like shock collar that goes from zero to 15 yeah, yeah. to 30 to yeah. 100. So, like, the older collars and some of the cheap ones have, let's say, like, 10 levels or 16 levels. If you can imagine two pizza pies, one pizza represents this collar, and it's got 100 slices. 
one pizza represents a cheaper collar and it's got 16 slices. They're the same size, but two slices is enough to fill you up. If I gave you one slice of this pie, it's equivalent to like four slices out of this pie. Mm. Way too much. But yeah. that's one slice. I can't go any lower than one slice. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So that's the difference in those in those collars. The other thing, too, to keep in mind that I've seen is that the cheaper collars that you can buy, either there's a delay in the response time. If you notice these two lights, when I press the button, it's simultaneous. They go simultaneous. And when I let go, it's simultaneous. There's no delay with me in, with regard to when I press the button or when I release the button. As soon as I release it, the, the correction stops. I've felt other collars where you when you press the it's on high, so. I just want to see the reaction. Yeah, yeah. When I press the button, the, Ooh, the boy, collar goes off. Uh, that's the, this is the stem, this is vibrate. Or that's tone, actually, no. I, I have it set to Sound. tone. Oh, yeah, that is right on the money. Yeah. No delay. No delay. And they're just quality, quality product. So you definitely get what you pay for. What other brands do you recommend for these? I like this is my favorite and the one that I use personally and professionally. It's called um, Mini, the Mini Educator by eCollar Technologies. And then the other brand that I like and I will support if an owner wants to use is Dog, Dog, Dog Yes, Dog. that's yeah. what I used to use. Yeah. I, I've said Sport Dog in the past and nothing against any Sport Dog users out there, but... Um, I just feel like Dogtra has done a good job at like being able, I like their digital display just like e-collar technologies. Dog, uh, Sport Dog has the rolling one and I really just don't appreciate how I can't fine tune. It's kind of like they have like little slots on oh, their little yeah, dial. Oh, so you can't get into a specific. Yeah, and I'm like, I can't tell if this thing is on 8 or 10 right now. It's oh, hard to tell. Oh, you don't want that. And I just, I like the precision of this. Yeah. And, and I like the fact that I can lock this dial. So whatever, if I find out your working level is 10, great. I can lock it on level 10, right? So now if I turn the dial, it doesn't change. Oh, so it's shit. a safety feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, some of the other collars don't have that. Most of them don't. So and this is a two dog kind of collar? Yeah, so you can connect another collar and then you'd have and how first do you, dog, How do you go dog. about doing something like that? What, connecting it? Yeah. Oh, that process is a little different. No, not connecting it, but as far as like that one collar, can, that one remote can, can where's one button collars. for each? Right now, this button controls this collar and so does this one. Okay, so if you had a second collar in your pack. Then this would be this collar and then I would set the other uh, collar to this button. Got it. So you'd be switching to. Yeah. Can you set? I know this is pretty brand specific, but are you able to set each dog for different levels? Yeah. Yep. On this one brand? Mm -hmm. brand? Yep. I can lock this one at whatever level, and then I can lock the other collar at whatever level is appropriate. Yeah, the other cool. thing that I can do too is this has a boost feature. What does that so, mean? So here, I'll show you. Basically, what that means is. With either one dog or two dogs, I can set the boost to, let's say in this example, I go to plus five. So look how when I press the button, see how it says five? Yeah. Now, what does it say when I press the red button? Ten. Because this, this is set to plus five. So So you're it's like a boost. I see. Boost. Literally a boost. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say I have a reactive dog or... Whatever the case, I, I, I need a higher setting in a certain environment. So normally the dog works great at level five, but sometimes, you know, he's getting real rambunctious with his brother and I call him back. He won't listen. And if I, t if I give him a correction at level five, he could care less. But level 10, it's like perfect. So I can quickly go from level five to level 10 without skipping a beat. Without having to Just go with shit. That boost feature. Yeah, without having to unlock this, change it, and then give him a correction. <laughs> the other thing, too, is that even with a two dog system, I can still do that. So while this is this collar and this would technically be the other collar, the way that I get around that is by pressing and holding, and this can happen quickly, I go boom. So black, then red. Mm. So same two buttons, first the black for the first collar, then the red. If I'm doing a boost for the other collar, it would be red, then black. Wow, so and there's a bunch boost. of settings on mm -hmm. these things. Yeah, great collars. What's the price range on something? 200 like these? bucks. Oh. Yeah, but Do worth you sell every them? penny. I don't. I have it on my Amazon storefront. Perfect. So, yeah, if anybody was interested in... That's going to be in the, in the link below yeah. or here or there.
So, but yeah, great cause. But like I said, definitely something that needs to be respected and not just thrown on your dog thinking it's going to be a quick fix. When people, when I talk to my clients about e-collar, I tell them, I say, listen, we can get results a lot faster. However, there is no doubt that the amount of attention to detail on your end is like it's it's doubled. Timing is everything. Consistency is everything. Bet. You know what I mean? Yeah, like you yeah. can't it's you're not just going to put this on your dog and, you know, zap them a couple of times and all of a sudden they're going to just know it doesn't work that way. Like you have to be there. And the idea, too, for me, when I'm using e-collars is like it's not it's not just about correcting the dog and telling them what not to do, but it's about reinforcing the behaviors that we want that from you them. That you want them to Yeah. Do. I, I want to help the dog avoid the correction. I know that this is there in case I need it, but I'd rather not use it. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and, I, and I apply that a lot is with reactive Is this on dogs. them 24-7? No, not at all. So 12 hours is the absolute max it should be on a dog. Even if you're not using it? Even if you're not using it. Are these tight? Like, these are super pronged. Yeah, I have, and I have different types of prongs. Like, these... These are the ones I normally have on, uh, for especially for like long haired dogs like shepherds, or like huskies. This right here. Mm. Whoa! And now we'll switch onto this right yeah. here. Yeah. So I take these two off and then put that on. Okay. Okay. And what? What? And that's just for long hair. Yeah, for longer hair and, and so it goes and in and just comfort. make contact. Yeah, because I mean this. Instead of having this, these two things poking in you. The other thing, too, is like, here's, here's something that I differ. Um, I know from other trainers. Like, for me, when I have my clients use e-collars with their dogs, I only have them put the e-collar here on the side of the dog's neck. I never have them put it behind the dog's neck. If, you're, if you want to, you can even just push it in here. So underneath our jawline to the side of our trachea, there's a little space here. You feel that? Yeah, yeah. Dogs have the same space. If you take this collar and you just set it right in here, you barely feel that. If you want, give it a try. And just tell me how, if it feels like, do you even feel that just sitting in there? Here, let me see. I'm just going to open this up. Yeah, go ahead. There you go. And where would I place this specifically? Let me see. Right, right here. And just kind of like press it in. Oh, no. Right? Yeah. So, same thing Ooh, with dogs. What is it bad to ask you to hit me no. at level 10 with this? You want me to? Is it bad? Are you tell I had it on level 10 when I practiced with my clients. Let's see. You feel that? Is it on? Let me see if it's on. I might have turned it off. I get it. There you go. It wasn't on. Oh, God. I was like, I could take a level 10 easy. <laughs> right here? Wait, hold yeah. on. Just in that little soft pocket. There you go. You ready? Yeah. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> Son of a bitch. It's just a little wake up call, though. I wouldn't say it's like pain. Yeah. I mean, I agree, but it's like a little like oh. Every little. dog's different. I've had dogs register this at like level two. So like, are they like? So level ten. Are they like be, whimpering? That's not what I'm looking for. What are I you have looking had. For? I, I'm just. I'm looking for a subtle reaction where they kind of like, like what the fuck is look that? around sometimes they might shake their head sometimes they might start scratching at it because that yeah. little prickly feeling yeah so they might start scratching that is definitely yeah. i'm already itchy um, yeah some other dog some dogs will yawn some dogs will be laying down and then you just kind of stand up almost they're like but you would ask like what are they doing like well they just stood up for no reason and it's because they felt it they were just kind of like what's that that's that's what i'm looking for when i first put it on a dog i'm not looking for like a whimper or anything like that. Just a little reaction. Yeah, but like I was saying, my placement of the collar is there. I don't like putting it on the back of the neck. If you take this and you press it on the back of your neck, press it in the back and just press it down a little bit and tell me the difference between the two. Oh yeah, you feel the prongs immediately. Yeah. There's no soft. There's nothing, yeah. So I don't like putting the collar on dogs back there. When I That's have pain. Yeah. When I have imagine them sitting with that like eight hours a day. Oh yeah. Now this is much better and you can kind of put it like <coughs> Let me see. all over. It's a little bit more comfortable. So we don't have to be so specific as oh, to Oh and the prongs don't go directly directly yes. in, but they kind of Exactly. Hold. Yeah. Fair enough. So the, you would say these are humane then, yeah? I mean, in my opinion, yeah, I think they're great collars. There's a lot of controversy. I know there is, and I'm sure people will, will hear I that. I use like, these on not. my pup back on in Jada, and it was night and day. Yeah. But, I don't know, people 
Well, you know, you know how people like be. There are consequences for not giving consequences. Mm. And so here's the thing. I tell Wait. people this all the time. <laughs> consequences for not to giving yeah. consequences. That goes with children and with pups. Yeah. yeah. And even grown men. And grown men, boy. <laughs> yes, right? sir. So, oh, yes. But I tell people this. And, and this is like, I don't judge anyone. And I support everyone's anyone's decision to handle their dog however they see fit. If I come into your house and I say to you, look, Tommy, I think that an e-collar would be a great choice for your dog. And you're like, look, man, I don't want to use that. I'd be like, no problem. I'm done. Find no a problem. different solution. Yep. There's a different solution. Well, there's different options. We can call it a solution if you want. But like, well, for option. example, let's just say that we're dealing with extreme reactivity from your dog. And I'm saying to you, like, an e-collar would really help us get to the bottom line stop this behavior very quickly. Like nipping in the butt. Yeah, and then we can focus on rewarding the dog. Um, and you said, I don't want to do that. Then I would say, hey, no problem. But here's what we're going to do now. We, we're In order to avoid the reactivity and keep your dog under threshold, we're going to have to really avoid dogs. And if she sees a dog, let's just say her threshold is 30 feet. If we get any closer than 30 feet, she loses her shit. So now mm. we got to stay be, beyond 30 feet from other dogs. Are you going to be able to do that, right? And you have to really focus entirely on just feeding this dog, praising, playing, and getting in. We still apply those things even when we use the e-collar, but we're talking about starting from 30 feet by, away from a dog and then working your way up closer. to being yeah, able yeah. to get closer. How long is that going to take you with your dog? It could take months. You know, It could take a year. It could yeah. take two years. I saw a video recently that another that a trainer had posted in his argument for a balanced approach and using tools like e-collars and prong collars and against a force-free purely positive and the video was a dog against the well, I'm sorry what? force force free as they call it or yeah. purely positive which oh, means like no use, yeah say less okay so, i just didn't hear right you. I'm sorry. yeah no worries so but anyway the video was a dog who um was apparently reactive towards other dogs mm. and it took this purely positive force-free trainer six months just to get this dog to approach a stuffed animal dog in a field whoa and they they they, they, they that was considered progress i would disagree i would completely disagree and I, I would say if you hired me and it took me six months to get your dog to approach a fake dog in a field then i am failing at my job that's oh. how I see it. Now, there might be other people that are watching this or just in general that would say, well, if it means that I didn't have to use an e-collar on my dog, then I consider that a win. And I say, good for you. But I don't think that, I think the majority of people in this world mm -hmm. and that I work with would not want to spend six months of training only to get their dog to walk up to a dummy dog. <laughs> yeah, fuck. That. I'd be pissed. If I paid yeah. you money yeah. and that's all you got my pup to do? For six months. It'd be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be on Yelp like this. Yeah. And I, and I deal with that a lot. And I, I work with clients and then I hear, you know, them tell me their stories and like, yeah, you know, they just, and I, I say to them, well, what do they, what did the trainer tell you to do about this problem? And they said, well, they just kind of told me to like stay away from other dogs. And I'm like, well, how are you supposed to do that when you're walking around the neighborhood and your whole neighborhood's filled with dogs? They're like, I know. That's why I called you. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, facts. Are you comfortable That's if we try? If we try this and I show you how it works, and I always is there a lot of reluctance that. usually? Usually not, because I think that I have a really good approach, and I and I tell people, listen, I leave the door wide open. I leave an, I always mark the exit routes for them, mm. and what I mean by that is look, I'm very clear point. about. Look, if I say this to you, like Tommy, this is what we're gonna do. I'm explaining to you how we're gonna use it. This is what's gonna look like. This is what we're looking for. If at any point when we're done, just let me know how you feel. If you don't like what you see, tell me. If you mm. feel uncomfortable, let me know. We'll and even when we're done, I ask you, how do you feel? Is this something you think you're going to be able to use? Right? And if I mm. see hesitation in you, I say, explain. What's up? How do you feel about it? I feel really bad. Oh, I totally understand that. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to maybe not use the e-collar to start let's do a couple of sessions without it see what kind of progress we can make without it and then we revisit that idea mm. and you tell me yes no problem we put that away we focus purely on what you're comfortable doing 
until you're ready. And then if we're having issues or if we're, and this is usually the case where um, we'll, the, we'll see some progress, but we're always kind of stuck in this area where the client will say, it's like, if I'm not stuffing food in their mouth, then they're going to react. Mm -hmm. And I say, let's try. Let's give it a shot. Let's try a correction because that correction is going to, the way that I describe it is I say, it's going to put up, excuse me, a wall in the dog's mind mm -hmm. where when they're like, I'm going to, all right. And it's like, all right, no, don't want to do that. Because yeah. there's, it, it, there's a consequence when that happens. And then once we get rid of that idea in their mind, we can really May focus. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. And so, but that's exactly how I handle my clients in any reluctancy. I'm not here to force anything on anyone. I'm just here to help. And if you're telling me that you're not comfortable using this, then there's no way that I'm going to make you're you gonna use it. You're going to force them. Yeah. Either. What's, do you see most reluctancy in a pup when this goes on them? Is this more of a, of a parent thing or is this, I mean, of an owner thing or is this more of a pup thing that's more reluctant? Um, well, I've had dogs, like, I've had young, I've had dogs that. You even got to put these away. We'll keep these out here just in case. I've had dogs that, um. I wouldn't say that they were reluctant, but I could tell that they were a little bit more bothered by the sensation, even at a lower level. And so what I would do is create a more positive approach to the feeling. So like now when we, when we feel it, they feel it at a low level, I start rewarding them. Mm -hmm. We start playing with them so we can help them acclimate to the collar better. Um, some dogs are just naturally uh, skeptical of things that are different mm -hmm. and that are changed. So I've literally had dogs where the owners would tell me like, yeah, if we buy anything new in the house, if we come home and there's a grocery bag on the counter, the dog won't go near the counter. The dog barks at the counter. And I've had, I've yeah, had yeah. A, quite a few people that have dogs like this, where they just notice every little thing that changes in the house. So putting a collar like this on them, which is a big change, even from the dog's perspective, like this isn't a small piece. It used to be flat and you know, it's like it's fabric. on their neck, or maybe yeah. they're not used to wearing a collar around the house. And now we're and now I'm saying, hey, put this collar on the dog. And now the dog is acting different, and it may not have anything to do with the feeling that they're feeling, but just the fact that they're wearing this collar is now different. different. So there's lots of factors that can go into a dog's behavior. And like even even I've seen dogs that once we start putting rules and boundaries on them, they people will kind of tell me that the dog is like moping around, and they ask me. Like, like it's not f like it's not energetic. Yeah, know. they're different, and I say to them, look, it's okay. It's a lot like imagine being a kid, imagine being a little badass kid that get away with everything. You're just running around, jumping all over the furniture, writing on walls. We all would have did it. <laughs> all of a sudden, your your parents come home one day and they're like, nope, crayons are thrown in the trash. No more this, no more that. How are you going to feel? You're going to be Shock. like, man, this life sucks. Like, yeah. I can't do nothing. I don't want to do nothing. This sucks. <laughs> and then a couple months later, it's your, you're used to it, and you're like, all right, life's not that bad. I still get to play my video games and have some pizza with my friends. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. They'll get over it. And I tell people that all the time. Like, yeah, when you make certain changes in your dog's life, when they realize that they can't get away with certain things and they can't do certain things that they used to be able to do freely and whenever they wanted to, mm. we're going to see some changes. So it's not always related to the collar, you know what I it mean? It could just be to a change of their yeah. environment. And yeah, blah, blah, blah. just telling the dog no. <laughs> yeah, fair. You know what I mean? Just like a kid, Shakes now you're them telling them no, and they're just like, what the hell, I've never been told no before. So, yeah. That makes sense. Very okay. interesting stuff. So then we go back to right before protection training, what is everything a pup needs to learn? Like what commands does a pup need to learn right before we enter protection well, training? And then we're going to close this commands. out. Uh, socialization. socialization, so normalization of the thing. environment. So people, uh, just to clarify, there's a difference between socializing your dog and overstimulating your dog. Overstimulation, give me that clarification. Yeah, overstimulation is going to be like bringing your dog to um, a populated area and letting like everybody that sees your puppy play with your puppy. Okay, good. Because that's not realistic. Good distinction. When your Belgian Malinois is two years old. And he looks like the devil's spawn. <laughs> People yeah. are not going to be so comfortable with your dog. and But your dog, being used to being treated that way as a puppy, remember, super sponge, imprinted, he's going to look at everybody as a play toy, everyone's play. And that's not what we want to teach the dog. So socialization means normalizing your dog to environments, people, places, and things. 
So yeah. bringing your dog everywhere you can and training and playing with them. So there's many different normal seasons yeah, you can see. And people with hats, yeah, exactly. umbrellas, yep. kids running sunglasses, around, screaming, kids. Yep. big people, short people, men, women, old, young. People Just so with, when they get out into the real world, it's not a shock to them. Yeah, they're not like, what the hell is that? I had a client one time, we were working at Bass Pro, and she had, um, we were working with two of her dogs, and this man walked by, and all of a sudden, as this guy walks by, the dogs freak out, and they were barking like crazy, and she, she kind of was like, oh my God, I don't know what happened, they've never done that before. And I looked at her real calm, and I said, I, it's okay. I said, I know exactly what happened. She said, what happened? I said, well, the man who walked by was walking by with a limp. He was an older man. He had something wrong with his leg. That's and specific. And he was walking by yeah. like this. And the, when as soon as the dog saw the guy, like you could see in their mind, they were like, what the? You know, and they looked different. at him. Yeah. yeah. And then they just they started barking at him. Because that's not socialization. They've never they, seen this never before. Seen They've never seen anything like that before. So... Just, again, socialization is about exposure and normalization to everyday real-world stuff. Skateboards, bikes, motorcycles, trucks, dump trucks, you know, construction, people with the hat, construction workers, like all that kind of stuff. And the other thing I tell my clients is when you're socializing your dog, think of it more as like bringing them to these environments and training them and applying what you do at home. So sit, stay, down, stay, come when called. You're doing all of this play, tug, fetch. You're doing all of these yeah. in these places so that all these noises and things like are background noise. normal. Yeah, they're there. Yeah, I just heard this motorcycle go by. Train go but by. But as I was, like, paying attention to my dad and we were doing training. So that's normal. You know what mm, I'm saying? Fair enough. The only time I've ever seen my shepherd act funny, and I was like, what the hell's wrong with you, was when I took her to the beach. Never taken her to a beach until she so was an adult. Completely out of place. So when she saw the ocean waves coming in, even though they were not like rough and crazy, she, I, I just saw, I've never seen her hesitate so much to do something. And I was like, wow, like she's such a solid dog because I took her everywhere and did a really good job of socializing her. Um, and she's very confident. I took her on hikes and I'd make her climb rocks and I'd help her down and all this yeah. stuff, right? But when she's seen came, everything. She's seen everything. <laughs> yeah. But she never saw ocean waves. Mm. So the first time I brought her to the ocean and I threw a frisbee in the ocean, she like ran up to the water and that wave came at her and she turned around and ran she back to me. That. I was like, "Who the hell are you?" Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was just funny. But that was just like, yeah, that's one thing I never did. I never got it's a wake the up ocean. call. That socialization, yeah. which is not everything. a big deal. Everything, but I know, but 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 the it's idea. Like, yeah, but that's just an example of like. And I've seen dogs like out here in Vegas, you know, we have the, the metal grates and yeah. the sidewalk with like oh, the electrical yeah, yeah. units underneath like, yeah. or the water or whatever. And I've seen dogs literally when they're walking and they come up to that and they scurry around it and they walk around it because they've never been on top of that. On and they will not walk on top of that. Because they've, never been, they've never been socialized. They've never been socialized. Yeah. Well, also, their parents didn't even take them out till they were freaking 16, 17 weeks. So they listened to the vet. Mm, so I love that. Yeah. Circle. But socialization. And uh, I would say obedience, top two Love things it. I work and on. Then you're and then we're ready working to get on protection. It. And protection is something I wouldn't even start putting a dog through that level of uh, stress and, and um, challenging them until they're a year and a half to two years year old. And a half to two I years. would say closer to two, where they're Love a little, it. little bit more confident in themselves. Fair enough. Yeah. I got a few rapid fire questions sure. for you. Same scenario, we're in this puppy world. We got the puppy, we're doing the training, we're getting ready to go into the protection. Any kind of resources that you would suggest that a person can maybe read through or look through or listen to? I know your I know your uh, Instagram is a huge resource. Yeah. Huge, huge leader of the pack, huge resource. But what else? We got books. I mean, what else yeah. kind of things? Well, the books that we have up here are some or the books that I've read. Um, real quick, just to touch on that, um, just some of the books that I've, I've read. And I have a lot more at home. I just brought a few. Um, Are that you I writing find. one anytime soon? Because you're such I a intend plethora, to. plethora of yeah, knowledge. I don't thank understand you. how this hasn't yeah. no, partaken. I, <laughs> I mean, the day the act of like sitting down and putting it all. My thoughts are just kind of like, you know, uh, they're they're everywhere. It's a matter yeah, yeah. of like condensing Honing them it yeah, in and then filing them. Yeah, yeah. Shit. If you talk to me about something, I can talk about it all day. But then, like asking me to write about it, I'm like, damn, there's so many. But you've done seminars. Things. Yeah. So like. Put the seminar in a book. No, for sure. I'm in the process of turning my seminar into a course right now, and then beautiful. Yeah, um, 
It, it's it's coming. This fool for packs sure. houses, just so you know. I'm gonna put that up on the screen. I've seen your seminars. Yeah, thank you. Packs houses. Thank you. Good for um, you. But yeah, these are just some books that I've read that have helped me in my career. Just what's so my you, number one to pick up? Um, I First. like how how dogs learn. This is gonna be a little bit more. Um, how do I say this? This is what I. This is one of the books I read in school that was given to me in school, part of my curriculum. What I love about this book is it breaks down the way that dogs learn from a very scientific perspective and it helps you understand like the fundamentals and the basics of how dogs associate things with their actions and how they actually learn and learn to do things and learn not to do things through this book through this book love it and then um let's see the aggression dog this is one of the first books i started reading when i came back from school because i wanted to learn how to deal with aggressive dogs um so one thing too about most of these books is uh they all are they have no pictures no, nah, just all reading. Oh, shit. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but these are all uh, ways to deal with issues without using any corrections. What I like about that, and I've said this before um, talking to other people, oh, that hey, I like, what I like about this is it gives me options to work with dogs without having to use tools like this. But I like having these as an option oh, for like use. a backup. Yeah, and honestly, if I come into a household, I'm like, look, we can do this, and we can get results, but it's going to take you so long. And, like, sometimes it's just not realistic for people. You just skip past that with this. Yeah, and we can say, look, we can create a consequence for your dog that's meaningful and appropriate, and then we can focus on all the positive reinforcement. Um, The Forever Dog is an amazing book. If you guys love your dogs, definitely get this book. Um, Just talks about how... Dogs, we've been lied to that dogs aren't supposed to be dying at 12, 15 years old, or they can't actually live till they're in their 20s. And um, oh, more and, words, no pictures. Yeah. Just be aware. And Just so, so you know. um, but it talks about the lifestyle of dogs and how, like, dogs being active and having a good diet is really the, the factors of, like, having them live a long life. So, going from there, feeding dogs is the more scientific. So anybody that's on the fence about raw food uh, or raw feeding, I should say, um, this book actually breaks down the science, like real real deal and compares like kibble, dry food and all that stuff. It has studies in here and really, really good for the anyone that's just like, where's the science? This is the book right here. Feeding um, dogs, bet. And then, the, let's see, canine behavior, you're gonna love this book because it's nothing but pictures. So there yeah, we yeah, go. Yeah. But this one's all about behavior, like looking for certain oh, signs. Oh, herding. And, yeah, and oh, here we go. We're talking about prepping. This is yeah. what we're talking about here. So that's a great book for visuals. Um, the Human Half of Dog Training. This is one of my favorite books. This really helped me to learn how to deal with people when training their dogs. One of the most. You're more or less training people. Yeah, than training absolutely. Them. Being able to communicate with people, like I said, you know, coming to someone's house, being empathetic with them, and also like coming from a place of non judgment. It's easy, I think, for, and I see this a lot in my industry, where people, trainers can be <laughs> very condescending and they have like a holier than now, like they think they're top shit because they know all the information and they're working with somebody that and knows nothing. And they're the leader. Yeah, and they feel yeah, all yeah, confident, like you need to to alpha. And I, yeah, and I have a very laid back approach where it's like, look, I'm here to help you and I'm just giving you the best advice that I know based on what I know, you know, and this is what you pay me for. So I'm not here to judge you. If I come to your house and your dog's on your couch and I told him not to be, I'm just going to be like, what, like, What's up? Tell me why you why you why are you doing that? You know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna judge you. I want to know why. What are you feeling? Are yeah. you feeling like you feel guilty, or is this a one time thing, or what's up? And then I'll reiterate why I don't think it's a good idea. But you know what? If you want to pay me to give you advice and you not follow it, then that's on you. That's not what you getting paid. Yeah. Capitalism. So, although I'd shit. rather work with people that take my advice. Of you course. Because I mean? so then the dog work, yeah, it works. So, for I mean, it's dog. more about that for me than the money. But yeah, I'm getting paid. And then the behavior problems in dogs. This book, I love this book. Um, again, just breaks down different ways to deal with behavior problems from the perspective of like not applying any punishment in training, but it is a part of training. Says this book here, How Dogs Learn. Punishment is a part of training. However, there are lots of people and trainers that try to avoid it as much as possible. I appreciate that because it gives perspective on different ways and interesting ways to try and deal with problems. 
but not all of those ways, as interesting as they may be, are going to be practical for like. You read that. There's all kinds of highlights. Yeah. In there. So, yeah. But yeah. Um, Love that. So there's the resources. Yeah, but those are for, that's just for like you know most of these books. I would say if you're a dog trainer, if you're a dog owner, the Forever Dog um, is going to be great. And then the Canine Behavior is actually not a bad book to get either. And Behavior Problems in Dogs. If you're a dog trainer, I would say any of these books would be a great, a great. Love buy. that. Um, as far as like protection work, if you're looking to get more info, I would say check out Learburg, L E E R B U R G. Um, they. I'll put it up on the screen. Um, they well, they have all types of training um i actually started i was visiting their website back when i had my shepherd hmm. um but yeah that would be i would say just look into getting if you're really looking to get into it check out locally like they have clubs you can do like a Schutzen club or french ring hmm. get into the club yeah. that. this is all sport work but geared in protection like love that. And holds and bite work and things like that okay and then so, getting into protection more rapid fire questions again uh, how do you get a dog? I know this is very specific. How do you get a dog used to the sound of uh, firearms, loud sounds? Um, well, one thing you can do is go to a out here. We go to the desert. Yeah, so Sloan. Keep, keep your dog in the car, and just start letting out a couple of shots. Um, that's the first thing I would do is keep them in the car, though. And then little by little, as you observe them and they're more comfortable. Roll down the window, open the door. The stage and steps. With you, yeah. But I would also be mindful that while you do want your dog to be comfortable near firearms, just be careful because we don't want to blow out their ears. So like, uh, one would, I, mean, I wouldn't imagine that you're you're consistently training your dog around firearms, but like every now and then, part of that socialization. Yeah, like I'm not I did saying that with, you're always blowing their fucking yeah, ears out no, with AR-15. But I did that with my shepherd. Oh, yeah, I took her shooting with me a couple of times with that intention of getting her comfortable around firearms. But w the reason why I say just be careful is because it's not like every time you go shooting, you should be taking your dog with you. Yeah, but I just think. to introduce them to yeah, the sounds so and to yeah. something ever happens at your house and yeah. you have to pull your gun. You don't want your For dog sure. to freak the fuck yeah, out like he's never heard it before. Yeah. Fair enough. So... Okay. But yeah, that's how. Start in the car, have a little distance, get a little closer, and then roll down the window and do the same thing. Just desensitize them that way. Love it. Yeah. Okay, now I want to ask. You said earlier your pup's on a raw diet. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty f very specific question. Mm -hmm. But in a world of preparedness and survivalist, survival, COVID hits. Mm -hmm. You can't leave your house for two weeks. Excuse me. You can't leave your house for two weeks. How do you? How are you feeding your pup? What kind of food are you storing long term? How well, are we keeping our pups fed through a through a very specific? Well, I mean, shit if something fan, like that preparing happens, the survival situation. What are you? How are we preparing? So, for example, I try to tell everybody: if your kid eats oatmeal, prep oatmeal. If your dog eats blank, prep blank. What's a nice. good thing to prep for dogs? Well, I'm gonna prep them kibble. Kibble. Is there like a shelf life on that? Do you know? Um, I don't yeah, know specific, usually, but yeah, it's a usually about a year. A year. Or so. Do you know if mylar bags and all that the same way you would do rice yeah, and beans? Yeah, you can do like you can do vacuum sealed and put um, for long term. Yeah, and I think you can definitely get more out of it. Yeah. Um, for me though, I don't. If I'm being honest, like yeah, my dogs are gonna have to take the hit on that one. Fair, but yeah. I mean, the realistic part is they would be a real asset in a shit hit the fan situation, especially a dog that's trained in protection yeah. and trained in, in uh, I don't know the word, reconnaissance. Like, hey, smell this, go get this or type shit. Detection. Scent yeah, detection. Yeah, yeah. A dog like that, is, you want that to be a part of your of your yeah. crew. I would say. How are you keeping that maintained? That's a, you got to feed yeah. that pup. It's a part of the family. How are you well, yeah, feeding it? You can have some stores of kibble, but like I, fi I feed my dogs a raw diet. But if like shit hit the fan, then I don't. There's no way I can. There's not much I can do with that anyway. You know what I mean? But yeah. what if it's kibble? You can't live your dog off kibble for a while. I or? could, yeah, they'd be. Because I mean, I don't think we're talking long term. Yeah. Like, but you know. But if I had, to, I'm just yeah. trying to make sure that when shit hit the fan and you can't leave your house for two, three weeks, even a month, what are we feeding our pups? Yeah, I would say if I don't, if I had stores of their food, but that ran out, then I would just feed them kibble. Kibble, mm -hmm. fair enough. So love that. Cool. Okay. 
Uh, I feel like bro, I feel like we covered so much. Yeah, we talked about a lot. Dude, we're definitely gonna have a part two. Okay. I'm gonna get Robbie in here. Yeah, do it. We'll definitely have one. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanna add? I mean anything, any message you wanna spread? And where, where can the people um, find you? Yeah, Let so me. check me out. Uh, Leader of the Pack L V. Um, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and then soon I'll be on YouTube. Um, I'm on YouTube now, I just don't really post a lot of content there. Um, but yeah, if I'm going to tell anyone anything about their dogs, it's, uh, be their friend, be the number one thing in their life. You know, that's what I tell all my clients. I try to help people build better relationships with their dogs through being their best friend, being everything that's important to that dog, their source of food, their source of fun, their source of play, but also, you know, the one who sets the rules and the boundaries. So it's just just like a good parent, you know what I mean? I don't have kids, but if I had a kid, I want them to come to me for everything. I want them to know, like, I'm I'm fun. But if I tell you to do something, I need you to do you it. Better get it done. You know what I mean? So simple as that. I love it. Well, bro, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's one cheers. more cheers, man, for a great podcast. Yeah, thank episode. you guys for listening. Thank you guys. I appreciate it, buddy. And uh, that's a wrap. Thank you guys for listening. We'll Peace. see y'all soon. Peace. Oh, man. Yeah, thank you, bro. I appreciate thank you. you.